Well, welcome everyone to this uh, second session of Round Tables uh, that we're doing with this amazing uh, critical studies program called Cosmic Brains. Uh, for those that are joining today for the first time, uh, Cosmic Brains is, is part of the Lab 03 Synthetic Minds, uh, which is uh, the line of programming that we carry out every year in Media Lab to explore different lines of research. Um, Synthetic minds explore uh, the deliberate composition of intelligent systems at different uh, scales and conditions. And uh, we have been working during the last few months into the development of different projects and uh, that will be showcased in a few months in our event open lab in February. As part also of the Synthetic Minds lab, we are carrying out this uh, critical studies program called uh, Cosmic Brains, where we are exploring uh, key topics in relation with things like AI, artificial general intelligence, and also the concept of the alien. Um, more precisely, during these sessions uh, that we had yesterday, today, and we'll have the, the last one tomorrow, we're exploring if alignment with AI is possible and desirable, and if it is, what kind of new kind of semiotics, uh, languages, but also other kind of gestures we shall create uh, to be able to interact and coexist with these different other kinds of intelligence. The program is divided in three main events, uh, a series of roundtables. Uh, you are here now with us, so you know about them. But also we have a cinema cycle. Uh, yesterday we watched uh, Ex Machina, and tonight at eight, in collaboration with Cineteca, we are gonna uh, watch The Arrival. Uh, but also a final symposium that we will do on Saturday that it will work as a wrapping up of some of the conversations that are taking place during these days in the round tables. Uh, Cosmic Brains gather uh, a, actually a pretty good set of different minds that comes from very different kind of backgrounds, from the science, arts, design, uh, philosophy, neuroscience, to talk about these different key topics of our time. Um, I, well, um, today we have, uh, yesterday uh, we have some of them, and today again we have uh, Ed Keller leading the, the table. Elliot Sharp is joining today with us, as in Lita Biswas Melanfi and Julia Taranda, and also in the public, uh, other guests uh, that are joining. Uh, some of them also you, you saw yesterday, like David Roden, Barry Bersadin, and also Peter, I think, is, is around here. Uh, so, Ed, Ed is a, a, a researcher, an architect and a practitioner which is interested about the structures of feeling which link cultural, infrastructural, ecological, and technosocial systems. Um, he's a designer, professor, writer, and also a musician, and a teacher. And he had been teaching during the, since 1996 in many different kind of institutions, mostly teaching architecture, film, and technology in, th in places like the New School at Parsons, Columbia GSAP, SciArc, also the new center where we were lucky enough to meet each other. And now it's one, also one of the mentors that is leading the eight experimental projects that we will showcase at the beginning of February. So Ed, thank you so much for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thanks, Eduardo. Uh, nice to see some folks come back again today. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I'll be brief in my introduction. Uh, today, just to give an overview to orient folks, um, remind them of what you might have heard and saw yesterday, uh, and for folks who wasn't, uh, weren't here yesterday, to give a bit of a context. And I'll also, of course, introduce our panelists today. I think, um, as I did yesterday, I'll, I'll introduce the panelists first, and that way we will uh, uh, we'll have uh, two or three minutes to talk about the introduction of the overall themes, and then hear from Nandita, who has a, a kind of a key presentation to get our conversation started today. So Nandita biswas Malamfi is here from Toronto. Thank you for joining us. A lot of people have flown to this event. Elliot as well, Julieta as well, Peter, David Roden. Uh, I think uh, we've all migrated into Madrid to join you. And Bonnie, did you, did you come from Barcelona? Yes, uh, yeah, very nice. So uh, Nandita biswas Malamfi. Oh, I can't read the Spanish. Yes. I can't read the Spanish <laughs> brief here. Hang on a sec. I want to do a proper job of introducing everybody. She's an associate professor in the Department of Political Science, an affiliate member of the Department of Women's Studies and Feminist Research, and director of the EGG, the Electro Governance Group, at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada. 
She's also served as acting associate director of the Center for the Study of Theory and Criticism at Western and is an ongoing associate and research fellow of the Center for War and Technology at Bath University in the United Kingdom. Her areas of study are situated at the intersection of political theory, continental philosophy, and media theory, focusing on the political dimensions of the contemporary neurosciences, technosciences, and works of speculative science fiction. She is the author of The Three Stigmata of Friedrich Nietzsche, Political Physiology in the Age of Nihilism. That was Paul Grief Macmillan in 2010, and is the co-editor with Dr. Dan Malamphy of the Digital Dionysus, Nietzsche and the Network-Centric Condition, Punctum Books, 2016. Her ongoing research and writing examines surveillance states, algorithmic governance, the politics of perception management, and conjoining all of these, what she calls larval warfare. Julieta Aranda is an artist, an editor of Eflux Journal, and co-director of the Eflux Online Platform since 2003. In her artistic practice, she composes sensorial encounters with the nature of time and speculative literature. She observes the altering human-Earth relationship through the lens of technology, AI, space travel, and scientific hypothesis. Working with installation, video, and print media, she's invested in exploring the potential of science fiction, alternative economies, and the poetics of circulation. Her projects challenge the boundaries between subject and object while embracing chance encounters, auto-destruction, and social processes. Elliot Sharp is a central figure in the avant-garde and experimental music scene in New York City for over 30 years. He's released over 85 recordings ranging from orchestral music to blues, jazz, noise, no-wave rock, and techno. He leads the projects Carbon and Orchestra Carbon, Tectonics, and Terraplane, and he has pioneered ways of applying fractal geometry, chaos theory, and genetic metaphors to musical composition and interaction. His collaborators have included Radio Symphony Frankfurt, Debbie Harry, Ensemble Modern, Kowali singer Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, Kronos String Quartet, Ensemble Resonance, cello innovator Francis Marie Wuti, blues legends Hubert Sumlin and Pop Staples, Pipa virtuoso Min Chao Feng, and jazz greats Jack D. Jeanette, Oliver Lake, Sonny Sharrick, artists Christian Marclay and Pierre Huy, and Bachar Attar, leader of the Master wow. Musicians of Jajuka. Elliot is a 2014 Guggenheim Fellow and a 2014 Fellow at Parsons Center for Transformative Media. He received the 2015 Berlin Prize in Musical Composition from the American Academy in Berlin. He has composed scores for films, documentaries, created sound design for interstitials on various channels, and has presented numerous sound installations in art galleries and museums. He's also been incredibly generous with his time in guest seminaring for us at Parsons in New York over many years, and so we're super grateful that you can join us, Elliot. We also have an extended panel, which is spread out through the, um, the kind of audience here today. David Roden, who was on our panel yesterday. David Roden's research has addressed deconstruction and analytic philosophy, naturalism, sound, and posthumanism. His book, Posthuman Life, Philosophy at the Edge of the Human, Routledge in 2014, explores the epistemological and ethical ramifications of speculative posthumanism. He also writes experimental fiction and concept horror. His novella, Snuff Memories, was published by Schism in 2021, and his new collection, Xenoerotics, also by Schism this year. Gabriel Montez is joining us via Zoom. Gabriel, welcome. Gabriel is a neuroscientist, a consciousness researcher, an enthusiast. He's a facilitator. He's a musician. <clears throat> For over 15 years, he's fused neuroscience with mind hacking, conducting research and teaching globally. He's the founder of Neural Print, a patent-pending brainwave-based authentication technology. He's also a founding member and guitarist of the world's first music act featuring an AI-powered humanoid robot vocalist, Desdemona's Dream, the Jam Galaxy Band. Gabriel has been working in emerging technology since 2017 on AI, VR, blockchain, robotics, and the Internet of Things. Michael Garfield, who joined us yesterday, is also joining us, I believe, today on Zoom. He's a paleontology futurist who works at the intersection of deep time, folk tradition, emerging media, and visionary art to anchor the psychedelic transformations of our era in an evolutionary narrative that places AI in the biosphere and casts humans as a geological process. He's the host of the Future Fossils podcast and the author of How to Live in the Future. He's released over 100 hours of original music and many paintings and has performed and spoken 
in venues ranging from NASA Ames to Moogfest to Burning Man to the Santa Fe Institute. Bonnie Brusadna is joining us today in person. Bonnie is an independent curator, teacher, and researcher. He's worked for Transmediality 2023 and 2022, since 2022, he's the curator of Done, the research project on new image ecosystems of the Photo Collectiana Foundation. Between 2004 and 2019, he directed The Influencers, a festival of unconventional art, guerrilla communication, and radical entertainment. That's CCCB Barcelona. Bonnie's the author of the essay, The Fog of Systems, 2021, and lecturer at the University of Barcelona, Elisava and Esti. And I think one more introduction. Also joining us via Zoom, Alvaro Domain. Alvaro is a Madrid-born, but now New York-based guitarist, composer, improviser, recording artist, sound designer, producer, and educator. He operates at the convergence of various styles of contemporary creative music. His sound and compositions are influenced by the avant-garde jazz and Western contemporary classical traditions, as well as metal and electronic music. He's performed and taught internationally, working with folks like Joe McPhee, Carl Berger, Elliot Sharp, Vinnie Golia, Henry Kaiser, Brigham Krauss, Alvaro Perez, who's going to, I believe, join us tomorrow morning for a music improvisation session here. Alvaro Perez is uh, Madrid-based himself. Jim Black, Ben Goldberg, Michael Bissio, Sam Newsom, Colin Marston, many others. He's released over 30 albums as a leader and or co-leader and is an active performer in New York's creative music scene, leading various groups in addition to working with numerous artists and projects, including the multimedia theater show The Effects of Gravity with astrophysicist Luke Keller and poet David Gonzalez. And actually, I don't want to miss Troy Therian because I believe Troy Therian is also joining us via Zoom today. Troy is a curator, engineer, and shaman. As a founding fellow of Fabrics, an artist retreat in rural France, he is developing a mineral diet using a float tank to commune and heal with teacher minerals the way Amazonian shamans do with plants. He was the architecture and digital curator at the Guggenheim Museum, where he organized Countryside the Future with Rem Koolhaas and Samir Bantal and the museum's first ever online exhibition, Azon Futures Market. At Columbia University and the Architectural Association, he taught courses on UFOs, psi abilities, weird science, arcane mathematics, and megalithic architecture alongside physical computing and blockchain tech. He's a citizen of the Metis Nation of British Columbia and the custodian of two plots of land that he is regenerating at the level of soil and spirit. Troy is just one of his identities. So this is a, an incredible group of people convened around this conversation. Perhaps some of you are wondering, how do we cast a net over all of these uh, amazing identities to tie it together? I'm not going to show any slides today. I, I'm just going to speak for three or four minutes about the themes that we're covering because we're bringing together artists, philosophers, musicians, curators, uh, science fiction authors, former marine biologists, in the case of Peter Watts, who's also joining us today in the audience. And so... What is the net that links all of this together? I, I think to extemporize here for a moment, it's to ask the question that Eduardo foregrounded a few minutes ago. What are the conditions necessary for mind to emerge? What kind of minds emerge from the conditions here on planet Earth? What kind of minds would emerge in other conditions elsewhere or at different scales, physically or different scales temporally? And then finally, and um, you know, Speaking to the moment now in the development of AI, what kind of conditions do we need to set up to design minds or facilitate minds given the context of the technological acceleration that we're undergoing right now? So we're bringing together all of these, these um, disciplines, people who think through these disciplines, all of whom think through these disciplines in extremely hybridized ways to try to focus on these pivotal questions. Um, what does it mean to approach the design of, the negotiation with, the facilitation of artificial intelligence by asking it from the context of speaking with the alien. Uh, and this, is, of course, is where Peter Watts' work becomes central to the discourse. What does it mean to imagine AI as an alien presence, as an alien agency, and how can we position ourselves in relationship to that? Is communication with the radically non-human possible? If it's not possible, what do we need to do? if we can do anything, if communication with the alien is partially possible, 
how can we learn from that idea and apply it to communication with emerging artificial intelligence? So perhaps that's a good summary of, of what's at stake. We search for parallel models across all of these disciplines to help us design AI. We think about what it would mean to approach cognition today with Nandita's talk using gesture as a kind of a sub-symbolic or trans-symbolic operational field and through sound, sound design and music. And we also ask, and I, I mentioned this yesterday, we ask what it might mean to design micro-worlds or pocket universes, whether they're simulation spaces and toy worlds for AI to play in, or as alternate pathways and sanctuaries in the eventuality that we can't communicate with artificial intelligence, that we cannot communicate with the alien. So our greatest challenge today, I would argue, is actually developing communication pathways with the radically non-human. And we can think of this from an ecological perspective. We can, we can look back to Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac as a foundational text in land ethic and deep ecology. All of these are oriented towards what it means to recognize the, uh, the intelligence, the non-human intelligence principles and systems that are around us, that are ambient, that are deployed. And how can we work with the models that are being developed in AI right now, large language models, foundational models, which often operate using billions of tokenized bits of content, words, code, images, and increasingly spatial, sonic, and movement data. All of these uh, within the framework of a kind of an expanded notion of language as a universal abstraction tool. And language, of course, is profoundly limited because it is an abstraction tool. So what does it mean for us to look, for example, to gesture? What does it mean to look into the deep time of our life world gestures, as, as Gary Tomlinson does in his work on A Million Years of Music, to try to understand the emergence of human modern cognition over literally a million years of gestures repeated and repeated and repeated, sonic gestures, physical gestures, and increasingly semantic and semiotic gestures. One argument that I hope I have hope for, but only a slim hope, is to say that at this crucial moment in history, when we have tasked ourselves with the design of micro-worlds and pocket universes, which might function as those sanctuaries or nurseries or perhaps prisons or escape paths, lines of flight, perhaps if we infuse them with multimodality and we nurture the communication between sentience and sapience, we can create a space for emerging AI to grow, interact, and collaborate to conceive a universal ontology. And as I said optimistically in the brief, a viable cosmopolitics might ultimately be catalyzed by this planetary and transplanetary structure of feeling that unites organic and synthetic cognition. But again, as will probably come up in the conversation today, perhaps that's overly optimistic. We will see uh, film tonight in the film series, as Eduard Eduardo mentioned. We'll be seeing the film Arrival, Villeneuve's film Arrival, adaptation of the Ted Chiang story. Um, and of course in that film, the aliens speak, sing, gesture, write. Their writing is kind of like hovering squid ink, that's a self-assembling system, simultaneously a kind of a, a semiotic and semantic system and a gesture. Um, Nandita has worked on this extensively. And um, wow. looking back, for example, to the kind of proto-languages of hieroglyphics mm -hmm. and Schwaller's work and so forth. And so, you know, I, I look forward to you kicking us off into this okay. incredibly heady space of topics. Um, but again, all in the, um, in the kind of framework of asking this broader question, what does it mean to think of working with the alien, the non-human, the radically non-human? What is the kind of bridge between sentience and sapience if gesture plays a role there? Mm -hmm. And what are gestures and what's the temporality of gestures? And how does music sit in that space? And how does ecology and the non-human presence sit in that space? So that's a, that's a kind of a, a very quick condensation of some of the themes that we're interested in. Some themes we spoke about yesterday and that we'll talk about tonight. Yeah. Uh, and with that, I will hand it off to Nandita. Okay. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, how lucky are we to be here in Madrid uh, having this conversation? I just wanted to thank Matadero and all the organizers and, yes. and Ed Keller, and um, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, 
I should say that uh, I'm dedicating this talk to my better half, who is in, in I left him back in Canada, Dan Malamphy. Um, when you're married for 24 years, I had to think of it, yes, to almost 24 years, <laughs> uh, you somehow, you, your, your minds merge, I think. And so, um, what I work on is also partly what he works on uh, from different angles. And this talk was very much um, born out of conversation with him. So, uh, I just wanted to add that. And so today I will talk about gesture and specifically in terms of the film Arrival. So I'm sorry if there are a few spoilers in this, um, but it's a perfect movie, I think, for uh, exemplifying the themes that I'm going to be talking about. So I'll just launch in there. Uh, in his Enjeu du Mobile, in a book that he published in 1993, the philosopher-mathematician Gilles Châtelet suggested that gestures are elusive, ephemeral, volatile, and, echoing the title of his study, mobile. And this as opposed to definitive, indelible, immutable, and immobile. Châtelet argues that the purpose of mathematical or choreographic diagrams is precisely to transfix the volatile vector of gestures, their lines of flight, and that this is the reason why geometers and contemporary cosmologists, never mind choreographers and conceptual artists, are drawn, pun intended, to the diagram's power of preemptory evocation and of capturing gestures mid-flight or on the fly. What we have here is the old alchemical or hermetico-philosophical dualism of the fixed and the volatile. The diagram attempting to fix or transfix the volatility of the gesture or gestures. Put down on paper, for example, a, diagra a, di a diagrammatized or transfixed gesture endures and is given a kind of stable definition, otherwise alien to its pre-individuated or pre-individualized or proto-formalized initial or initiated condition. Perhaps we could call the diagram the metastable transfixion of the, de of the gesture and the sign or symbol its ultimate and most stable transcription. This accords with Châtelet's claim that, quote, a diagram can transfix a gesture, bring it to rest, long before it curls up or congeals into a sign, end quote. So Châtelet and his colleague Deleuze were both very much influenced by the work of Gilbert Simondon, the philosopher of individuation, trans-individuation, and the pre-individual or pre-individuated condition. So my proposition that the gesture is pre-individuated, pre-individualized, and that the individuated, individualized gesture is either its transfixed, metastable diagram or its transcribed, stabilized sign, qua symbol, is by no means far-fetched. The hermetic scholar René Schwaller used the word symbolique for the midpoint between the gesture and symbol or sign in his analysis of the hieratic, as opposed to strictly literal dimension, of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. The symbolique was for Schwaller the oblique sketch qua diagrammatology that would capture, or at the very least attempt to capture, the gesture mid-flight before it coagulates into a sign. In a lecture given at the Congrès des Symbolistes in Paris in 1956, Schwaller explained that, quote, the aim of the hieratic symbolique is no longer to translate things into sensory terms, but to put ourselves into a state magically identical with the symbol object, so as to become heavy 
with the quality of weight, to become red with the quality of redness, to burn with the quality of fire. We can imagine and or embody actions and states by transmuting them in this way, what observation of the symbol object shows us. It's easier to understand when we attempt imaginative imitation of a living being, the way another being moves, looks, and sounds. In such a living exchange, we know, we quote unquote, know the object because we too experience mentally and emotionally the impulse and intention that obliges it to behave as it does. The characteristic function defining the symbol object is always what we need to imitate in imagination so as to awaken the intuition which makes us conscious of the nature or phusis as the, as the ancient Greeks called it of the symbol. This is why a symbol which takes the form of an object serving a useful purpose or which represents an organ is easier to investigate than abstract intellectual symbols. And so we find that the hieroglyphs of the Egyptians generally represent a gesture, a principle in action. For example, the Ankh, under the name the Key of Life, may be depicted as a mirror. That is, so to speak, a grammatical hint for evocation by means of this symbol, just as in spoken language, verbs, adjectives, pronoun, pronouns, etc., serve to link together the essential meaning of nouns. Schwaller's working definition of gestures as principles in action and his suggestion that a gesture's symbolique or oblique image symbol functioning in Schwaller studies in very much the same way as the diagram functions for Gilles Châtelet, that is, as a way of transfixing the gesture prior to its curling up into a sign, operates as a kind of grammatical, or more precisely, diagrammatical hint, a hint for evocation and evocative provocation, which one can follow like a Deleuzean line of flight or a Foucauldian diagonal that cuts across or cross-cuts established or fixed understandings, opening up to and onto actual and or virtual experiences, leads me via the hint to a proposition with respect to this actual or virtual experiential condition, namely that it cross-cuts or cuts across consecutive causal, narratological coordinates and gestures toward an alternate dimension. One that Howard Hinton defined back in 1904 as the fourth dimension. Within the gesture, I would argue, there gestates larvally an articulation of this fourth dimension, that of the ion or articulated lifespan rather than of chronos, the chronological or individual or individuated object, the individual individuated subject. Recalling here that the ancient Greek physiologists proposed three different orders of time, that of the ion or entire lifespan, the entire lifespan of any given object or subject taken all at once, as a whole, as one whole thing, of chronos, or the moment by moment, day to day, year after year, series or sequential unfolding, and of kairos, or the individual moments themselves. We can understand the ion as encompassing the whole time frame or complete arc, if you will, of a given thing object or subject. Being beings that are three-dimensional, that experience the world in three dimensions, albeit carried forward by the arrow of time, we can experience or perceive individual moments, kairos, and sequential unfoldings, chronos, but not all at once, 
as one thing altogether a given object's or subject's ion. In its escape from the conditions or coordinates of chronological, and yes, even chirotic capture, the pre-diagrammatized, pre-symbolized, pre-summarized gesture gestures toward this whole with a W, in part by way of its being a whole without a W, in the fabric of world and wor word fabrication, world and word formulation. And only when observed or experienced in and as a pre-individuated, pre-individualized gestation qua generation, a veritable ontogenesis of sorts. The essential terminological interrelation here being sketched is one that links gesture and gestural suggestion with gestation and generation. With a generative principle or Schwalerian principle in action that literally or rather symboli symbolically or symbolique as Schwaller would say, that is to say obliquely enacts the prescription the pre-individual encryption or ionic scripting of a specific ion. So what I'm proposing here is, and this is thanks to Dan Malamphy that I have this term, what I'm proposing here is an iontology. Okay? <laughs> um, and, and, and this is where arrival, I think, really beautifully exemplifies what I'm talking about. So Denis Villeneuve's 2016 film, Arrival, deals with the arrival in our human, all too human 3D world of creatures, uh, the arrival of creatures that move, think, and communicate in four dimensions. The protagonist, Louise Banks, starts remembering shards of a past that she never lived, glimpses of things that haven't happened yet. As she slowly realizes, that these fragmentary memories are actually memories of the future. And that for all its blind spots, gaps, and holes, her life forms a whole with a W, which from a 3D perspective can't be perceived, but from a 4D perspective can be. The 4D creatures, the heptapods, communicate in the language of whole with a W. Uh, lifetime loops with a circular logic that transcends any single or singular time and place. Their script, from Louise Banks's and her fellow human's perspective, is a series of loops, circles or cycles, curved or bent lines that fold in on themselves. Now, in Villeneuve's newest film, um, Dune, this logic and language is one that folds space and space-time, allowing its users to travel vast and, in our, in our case, impossible distances without actually moving. Since in four dimensions, they, the users, are always already there, as long as they have been there, as long as they have been of their being, or Dasein. In his treatise on the fourth dimension, Howard, which is an amazing text, and I highly recommend it, um, Howard Hinton also notes that if a two-dimensional creature from the flatland were carried upward beyond its own dimension into the third dimension, the flatlander would suddenly be able to see through two-dimensional walls. And something similar would happen, of course, to in the case of a three-dimensional creature like Louise Banks in Arrival or Paul Atreides in Dune. If they were lifted out of their own three dimensions, into the fourth dimension, uh, they, would able, they, they would also be able to see through three-dimensional walls, three-dimensional obstacles, and witness a world, just as in the third dimension, two-dimensional objects seem to be the shadows or two-dimensional projections of three-dimensional objects, three-dimensional objects seem to be the shadows or three-dimensional projections of four-dimensional objects. But a three-dimensional shadow is akin to a sculpture or architectural construct. And as a creature in this fourth dimension moves about, 
these three-dimensional sculptures or architectural constructs likewise move about, shifting and rotating, fracturing and fragmenting, the action of 4D tesseracts or tesseractions. To lift a phrase from Christopher Nolan's film Tenet, quote, we live in a twilight world, end quote. <laughs> a world of shadows, and in our case, the three-dimensional shadows of a four-dimensional space-time. Our perceptions and descriptions and notations, that is to say, linguistic formulations of the world, are in this respect a twilight language. And the strange slippage we often find in our words, in our expressions, are evidence not only of what we call wordplay, be this intentional or, as in the case, much more often unintentional, but also of a kind of shadow play, the play of shadows, both in the sense of lighthearted, perhaps sometimes shadow-hearted playfulness, and in the sense of a whole theater or spectral, never mind conceptual and spectacle, uh, sorry, a whole theater of spectral spectacle, a very old notion made famous uh, by Plato in the seventh book of the Republic, where Plato suggests that we live in a world like people dwelling in a cave, perceiving the shadows on the walls as if they were the be-all and end-all of existence as such. Just as folds in our three-dimensional world are difficult to perceive in their two-dimensional shadow form, so are folds in the four-dimensional world difficult to perceive in their three-dimensional shadow form. And the latter, folds in four dimensions are folds that not only fold space, but also fold time. In some, they fold space-time. Being stuck in the confines or the cave of our three dimensions, we are, like the people in Plato's cave allegory, shackled in place and tethered to one straight timeline, which we call, because of this, the arrow of time. If we, were if we were able to fold time, our past and our future could overlap, adding a new dimension to our worldly three dimensions and permitting us a revisiting and or pre-visiting of various parts of our lives. The heptapods in Villeneuve's arrival live, breathe, and move in a world with respect to which ours is a shadow or play of shadows. Their squid ink writing takes the form of full loops because they reference and exist in time loops, loops in time. And they are fluid rather than fixed in place, fixed in time for the same reason. In Villeneuve's arrival, the heptapod that is given the name Abbott dies precisely because it chooses not to escape the rebel soldier's detonation. It could have escaped it, but chose not to in order to save Louise and Ian, as the other heptapod, given the name Costello, explains to Louise via its fluid loop writing. Abbott is dead, states Costello, with an explanation for this death that is tellingly also written in the present tense. Abbott chooses to save Louise and Ian. Abbott is dead, and Abbott chooses to save Louise and Ian. These are two statements on a looped continuum. When Louise then asks Costello to explain the purpose of their visit, the purpose of their arrival, Costello's script gestures towards the future, still, of course, in the present tense, as the source of their present objectives. Quote, 3,000 years from this point, humanity helps us. We help humanity now, returning the favor, end quote. Returning a favor that takes place in the future. Four-dimensional logic. The aporia or obstacle to Louise Banks' eventual learning to use such four-dimensional logic is and was in the film her own worded world, and especially in her own worded world, her sense of herself as a particular and particularized, particularizable person, rather than instead something or someone in flux or in, 
perpetual progress or process. That is, say, as an ongoing individuation rather than straightforward individual. Once her sense of straightforward self is, as, is discerned as something porous, the aporia disappears, or is at least overcome, as she becomes as such overhuman, übermenschlich, as Friedrich Nietzsche would have said. And she opens up her theater eye, the great third eye that looks out into the world through the other two. This entails a kind of passivity, I suppose, since it necessitates a sort of letting go, or what Meister Eckhart, prior to Nietzsche, called Gelassenheit, the letting go that is itself a letting be, an Abgeschiedenheit, allowing something like the fullness, maybe the excess of being its place, its play, its time. In arrival, fixed rather than fluid notions of the self, understanding selfhood as something altogether individuated in the present rather than always in the process of individuating, keeps everything fixed in and fixated with the now, inextricably pinned or bound to what we now think that we know, closing off the outside, the unknown. Overcoming the self over humanism of a philosopher like Nietzsche opens in its negation a kind of negative capability or letting go, allowing in this weird undoing a glimpse at the surreal theater qua theory of futurity in formation. The future in formation, the future in its becoming, is basically, from our three-dimensional perspective, what the future is. It is larval, both in the sense of still unformed, still in formation, and in the more strict etymological sense of the word larval, it is shrouded, clouded, covered over, or masked. When the philosopher René Descartes wrote, just prior to publishing his 1626 Rules for the Direction of the Mind, that he was entering onto or upon the great stage or theater of world philosophy, as all actors do, that is, masked. His words were, larvatus prodeo, I advance masked. <laughs> he was acknowledging that his public persona, his public identity, was a cover, a cover story, underneath, behind, beyond which, in truth, lies something else. Descartes admitted that such a mask, such a masking, allows him to cover over his shame, again, as all actors or performers do. In his book, Illegibility, William Allen touches upon this when he writes about what he calls ontological shame and explains that shame would then be the corollary of futurity. When we speak or theorize futurity, or at least from our limited 3D perspective, there is, or there should be, a feeling of shame, a feeling that something is being lost or glossed over, abandoned, perhaps because every formulation of the future denies the future its status as not yet formed, as if we are tired of waiting for or awaiting the future and abandon the wait, the waiting altogether. Perhaps theorists of futurity should be more like Didi and Gogo in Beckett's Waiting for Godot, who, even when they think of doing it or resolve to do it, never actually stop waiting. Samuel Beckett and Maurice Blanchot have, or rather had, much in common, including a refined sense of waiting and in waiting of boredom, which Heidegger called the ground mood of being. Boredom to the point of dread, or if you per prefer, as Heidegger himself may well have said, existential dread. For isn't that what life is all about? What life really is? Awaiting, an awaiting. More to the point, isn't this what the future, futurity, is all about? As William Allen puts it in the quotation for Blanchot's Awaiting Oblivion, 
The source of all waiting is the future. This does sound very much like a 4D statement. The source of all waiting is the future, and one that throws the question of waiting into a whole new light. And so uh, it is not a question of waiting for the event to happen, but rather of waiting as a mode of experience of that which does not take place, but nevertheless allows everything to take place and take time. I'll just end there. Mm. Thank you, Nandita. Yeah. Well, I've been reminded of um, Rilke recently a few times, and uh, yeah. thinking of the opening passages of the, um, the Neutrino Elegies, mm -hmm. you know, because one can imagine emerging AI as an angel terrifying, because it so serenely disdains to destroy us. But I also remember another line from Rilke where, um, where they say, we need to learn in love as in life, letting go. <laughs> yes, very Eckhartian. Yeah. So how do we bring the 4D time pincer movement to the development of AI? <laughs> yeah. And what do we learn from, like, can we learn about communication or even metacommunication from Villeneuve's arrival? Yeah. Um, please, please yeah. do. One thing about arrival is, of course, they're biological entities, as are we, for the most part. And there is a certain commonality that exists among biological entities, which isn't actually addressed. It doesn't really translate to film so well, except maybe in John Waters, uh, what film was it that he used, Odorama? <laughs> the notion yeah, right. of chemical, you know, and yeah. there's a, I mean, we're awash in a sea of neurotransmitters right here in yeah. this room, as in every group mm. of entities, of uh, living entities. Yes. And so the element of communication that separates us from AIs at this point, which I'll also say, not being a Luddite, but I still want to say AIs are not intelligent. They're very fast databases, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we have to disabuse ourselves of the notion that we're communicating with something that is communicating, mm -hmm. you know, and until it develops self-awareness. So we have a commonality that is chemical, that is not seen, it's not heard. It's very subliminal, I mean, completely subliminal, whether because we're not aware of the mechanism of this communication yet, or because uh, maybe it doesn't exist, and maybe we're not it's... taking the right drugs. Yeah. Well, there's well, there's also <laughs> the notion of gut bacteria, which I've been yeah. reading a lot about as the uh, kind of generator of a lot of thought and as a lot of uh, shaping of the things, you know, the, the part, why we partner with certain people, the gut bacteria says, mm -hmm. that's the one, you know, yep. and, yeah. and on and on. So the, the question then is, how do we recognize when we're in touch with an entity that's intelligent? You know, again, with the, there was a strong visual element in Arrival that, and it's also uh, quite nice the way they present their communications are like mandalas also, which is uh, uh, very much an endless cycle. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead. No, 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 you go. You go. No, I was just about to say that actually I think the depiction of the heptapod was problematic. It kind of, um, in some senses, I think that Villeneuve probably felt that he had to depict the alien. Um, well, in the original book, there were more like spiders. Very much, yeah. Eight, the, anyway, there were eight. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Um, you know, in some senses, I, 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 you're right, though. And I think um, Frank Herbert in Dune makes a lot of that chemical aspect that you're talking about, because the whole transmutation of the spice experience is chemical. And in fact, the awareness that one, you know, takes on and, and, and enters into is totally internal. Yeah. Um, and it, and it, sub in Dune, atomic. those those trans temporalities are really beautifully described when Jessica first converts the water of life. Exactly. You know, and she yeah. meets all of her ancestors, and they're yeah. all really stunned that she's yeah. pregnant. You know, like you did this, and you're pregnant. Yeah, you know, it's a fourth dimensional kind of yeah. experience. 
Yeah. I would argue. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I was uh, thinking a lot about what you were saying about uh, gut bacteria and like the sense of being an individual and yeah. representations. And of course, I mean, like one of the things that comes first is that um, clearly, I mean, we are we are a uh, uh, assemblage of lives, right? Like uh, much more than a single uh, individuated or indi or individual uh, being. So, indeed, the, a lot of times when we talk about the creation of an artificial intelligence, we are not thinking about an assemblage. I think we're still thinking about this uh, single individual. individual. Yeah. So um, maybe this sense of uh, being that is not, uh, you know, that is multitude mm -hmm. can be a lot more productive in terms of uh, not only creating it, but being able to recognize it, right? Mm -hmm. Like perhaps what we are like, uh, this alien intelligence is a system and not a being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, mm -hmm. In relation to that, I've uh, just started reading Merlin Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, Merlin. which is about uh, fungi and all its mm -hmm. manifestations and as a communication system among all plant life and, of course, among animal life, too, and us, although, again, we're not aware of the communication lines. It's subliminal mm -hmm. or perhaps operates in spite of our own presence, you know, that we don't, they don't mm -hmm. need to fill in, fill us in on what's happening right. f for it to work. You know. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, there is, a, I think there is this book, um, it's uh, Kurt Vonnegut, I think it's uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, mm -hmm. where the, you know, when the aliens are looking at the... Yeah, the Trophamadorians. Uh, the the, the Trophamadorians, when they're looking at us, we are like worms, right? Like we are this like, long things over time. So I'm, I'm not remembering in Arrival, do, do we at some point get to see how we are perceived by the aliens? Because I, I kept mm -hmm. thinking, um, you know, that if like, I can't how is that? I mean, like in Flatland, right? There is mm -hmm. this, uh, I mean, you were talking about that. Yeah. There are these, yeah. um, uh, the limit, uh, the, the limit of visualization, uh, a way of perception that the 2D beings have for the 3D beings. Mm -hmm. And, but also the, the, the way in which they are seen. So yeah, yeah. I would very much like, as, as in the same way that yesterday we were talking about how the um, Eva from Ex, Mach uh, Ex Machina uh, was, is she looking at humans the way uh, we are or are, they, are we just points of data? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what is the, yeah, exactly. how is time represented in the, in the visual system? In the, of yeah. The oh, once I, I'm gonna, when I watch it tonight, I'm gonna keep a close eye on that to see if there's, but I'm not sure that, uh, does anyone know if well, the... Well, no, Louise Strong begins to look at her own life the way... The way the haptopods do. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Especially in the looking at her daughter's yeah. Yeah. demise. Yeah. But, but we don't get to see what the heptopods are seeing when they no. look at Louise, no. let's say. No, but the film structure is very, is very beautiful because you remember in the beginning you actually have those extremely intense flash forwards. Mm -hmm. um, even before you understand what the narrative is. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're already in the kind of you're overarching the structure ion. of the film, mm -hmm. you're already perceiving the ion, exactly. You're, you're, well, the viewer is seeing the kind of four-dimensionality uh, without understanding what's going on yeah. until the end. Yeah. Well, you know, in a, way, in a way it's like the deja vu. I mean, a deja vu sometimes you think of as being in a look into something that might happen, or you recognize it after it happens. I mean, it's an artifact of our nervous system. but. Who knows who's to say that it isn't actually a look outside yeah. of our own linear time. Absolutely. In, in, That's in a great example. Looking uh, at a science fiction book by Michael Swanwick. Michael is a physicist who lives in Philadelphia. A number of books are all very humorous uh, looks at humanity. And in the sands of time, it's a fluid future present relationship. And of course, deals with a lot, all the paradoxes of it. And I won't give away the punchline. But it's a fantastic book. Yeah. I mean, the, the question is, if you can see and act and move about from time, then like the observer of a quantum event of Schrodinger's cat, does it affect it? I mean, with Louise, it doesn't affect her no. life with her daughter. But in, but in Dune, it does. Mm -hmm. In whoever has that transfiguring experience, you know, with, with whether it be Jessica or Paul or... Um, even Paul's son in, this, in the following books, um, 
they do seem to uh, be able to, um, you know, see beyond their own life and into the uh, generations and, and assemblages mm -hmm. of um, entities that make up the system, right? So. Uh, well, it's like you, know, you take yourself out of the equation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you have to be. Yourself dissolves, right. really. Becomes part of the kind of chemical soup that is generating, you know, well, in, in everything. Fact, it's something that, you know, many artists feel that they enter a state of, when they certainly in improvised music, you enter a state where you cease to exist, ideally, mm -hmm. except for what I call the accountant telling you that, you know, this battery is now dying or that you have to step on this pedal or look at the conductor or, you know, signal. But the, the flow state does exist outside of linear time completely. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, this, this reminds me of a point that Peter brought up yesterday, if I remember correctly, about distributed selves and the question of survival instinct and drive. And if, um, if a, a collective or a species or an assemblage was distributed enough that there was no risk left in the system, um, not only would be there a different sense of self, um, but there would be a, a completely different relationship to survival, which is, I think, one of the points that Peter was, was bringing up yesterday. Uh, but there would be also a different relationship to um, agenda, intentionality, expected outcome. It's very much like what the, the heptapods seem to have in Arrival. They seem to be at peace in a profound way with the fact that one of them is death process, I think they use the term, at least in the subtitles or something. Uh, and it's just something that happens. If you've been here or you would be here, then you're here. Uh, and it's just something to accept. Um, did, doesn't that happen in Slaughterhouse Five too? Don't the Trifalmadorians know about the end of the universe? Yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the, that's the 4D part of it, you know, like the ab ability to see, to experience ion the lifespan, right? Which we can't do because, you know, it reminds me of the, that scene from Thus Spoke Zarathustra when Zarathustra meets the dwarf who kind of makes fun of him and says, you know, you can't go, you can go forward in time, but you can't go backward in time, you know? And so mm -hmm. the whole notion of the eternal recurrence in some senses is to spite, to tell the dwarf, no, we can go backward and forward in time. Yeah. So Let it's me, kind of a 4D type of um, idea there, I think. The, I guess the question becomes, is something that is in your perception as real as in your memory? So you can say, yes, we can go, but we can relive all of our moments in a way when he, he becomes unstuck in time, which yeah. I always loved as a phrase in yeah. uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, yes. that you can do that yourself through projection, through memory. Yeah. There's a, a great um, a scene in Dune. I don't know if it's the first one or, the, or one of the subsequent books, but there's a technique where you're, you look, this is a sort of Bene Gesserit technique. You look at your hand and you imagine it aging. And you, and you really work on it to imagine it aging. And then once you get that, you go backwards and you imagine it getting younger. And so the technique is sort of, in some senses, you employ a technique to kind of imagine what the ion Sure, it's would like be. a mandala. Yeah. Actually, it's funny because in the early days of virtual reality, the hand was the... Uh, the, the, the digital. First, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that hand figuration in David Lynch's Dune is actually quite important also. Mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't function gesturally so much, I feel. It functions more like a, like a symbol yeah. hovering, yeah. closer to the kind of hieroglyph that you were talking like about. Like a diagram. Yeah, like a diagram. Actually, thank you for reminding me because I, I was taking notes about that process and it, the, the function of the diagram is to resist um, a kind of an arrest or a, a transfiction. Well, the diagram is a transfiction <laughs> but, of but, the gesture. But it doesn't allow the gesture to become semantic, right? No, the sign is, is yep. the, I, I would say, yep. that's the sign. Because the diagram is sort of, it is, not complete and therefore that is you know it's 
incompleteness is exactly what allows it to um, be potentially part of, you know, a whole with a W yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. So I was thinking about, Elliot, your work and your scores. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a series of works that are graphic notations mm -hmm. that don't look like conventional musical notation. No. And you ask the musicians to... But the seeds of them are musical notation. Mm -hmm. it, uh, if I could explain the process yeah, just please. for a second. Yeah. It started, I was doing a lot of real-time processing where I would give musicians a score or an instruction set. And as they played, I would process them using either plugins in my computer or other hardware. And I began to be tired of the sound coming from speakers. I wanted the musicians to create these sounds, but acoustically, because I felt that there was a richness in the amount of transients in the acoustic sound that was mm -hmm. lost, even though other things were gained by the electronics, mm -hmm. of course, and I still like electronics, but there's something else that was missing. And I began to take some of my scores and in Photoshop process them the same way or uh, it's in metaphorically the same way that I was processing the audio. I would use feedback, I would use distortion, I would use inversion, I would use chaining, I would use layering, um, what else, a modulation with different waveforms. And the thing is with musicians who have some familiarity with the way sound looks, they could take to the scores immediately and say, that's oh yes, of course that's a sine wave, and here we see a sine wave and a square wave together modulating this, this image and they could generate something that was very often exactly what I was hoping to hear. Wow. In other cases, some musicians, like jazz musicians, say, wow, it's a cool picture, man. I'm just gonna wail. I'm just gonna wail, and, yeah. And, you know, which is kind of, was great anyway, because they're always talented musicians, but not necessarily tied into, you know, the intent or the desired intent. So the thing about those type of scores is they are ambiguous. I mean, they are both an instruction set for the musician to play off of. There is also the question for the audience who often see the score projected, are the musicians somehow generating the score? And then there's the fact that it's, or, or is it um, just a soundtrack for these images? And then finally, these things exist as retinal art on, the, on their own. So have a functionality outside of the musical and sonic. Yeah. You know, this reminds me, I, I don't want to speak too much, but I just want to drop this story because I wanted to say it yesterday as well. And I think it'll resonate really strongly with a lot of people here today. Uh, also, some of the folks on the Zoom call, I think Michael and Gabriel, especially as musicians, um, this will kind of ring a bell. And Gabriel, you'll laugh because we've talked about this. There's this great interview with Glenn Gould in Rolling Stone uh, many years ago. And along the course of the interview, one thing that he does is he talks about difficulty that he has playing a particular piece of music while he's on tour in the Middle East or in Israel. And he's also fighting with a piano that has been damaged by the, humid the lack of humidity. Mm -hmm. So he's got a piano that is really fucking hard to play. Yeah. And he's also playing a piece which has one passage in it and he says this in a very funny way from the interview, I'll paraphrase. He basically says that every time he watched a pianist try to play this piece, they would approach that passage and they would start to look really terrified. And then they'd be like a deer frozen in the headlights or something just as they got to that passage. And he was always like, well, whatever, you know. And so he, when he has to play that piece, instead of rehearsing the entire piece, he goes directly to the difficult passage and he tries to play it and he stumbles and he gets a, a mental block and he can't play it. So then he, in the interview, he asked the interviewer, I, I'm probably messing up the sequence, but in the interview, uh, the, in, the interviewer, um, he says to the interviewer, have you ever had this process of dental anesthesia where instead of giving you a shot for your surgery, they put a, a pair of headphones on you and they give you two dials and one dial controls noise and the other dial controls a sound that you're familiar with, like a piece of music that you really know well. So for me, it would be, I don't know, Box Goldberg Variations played by Glenn Gould. And the noise has to almost overwhelm the music. And it has to be a piece of music you're familiar with, apparently. And you just have to control the dials so that you're always hunting for the music that you're familiar with. And apparently, he says, 
it's absolutely 100% effective as an anesthetic process. But I, he says, but I would never do it because, of course, you know, I mean, you'd be crazy to not have anesthesia for a dental operation. But he says, but it's a fail-safe process. And then he relates this to the process that he himself used to practice when he had these mental blocks. He says, ideally, you get a really loud radio or a television set or both. And you put the radio on your piano or next to it, and you crank the volume up so high that you can almost not hear your playing but you can feel your playing. You can't hear yourself well at all, but you can feel it. Oh. And you practice to get through the block. And then the other thing he says is, the, the block that he had when he was doing this performance in the desert, he drove to a place and he looked out onto the ocean and he tried to remember the kinesthetic of his piano at home, which had a particularly light action that, you know, and then he talks about how the piano was dropped off a truck and he had to have it rebuilt. But basically this piano was like the er piano for him in terms of tactility. Mm. And he said that he put himself into the kinesthetic space of his own piano in his living room mm. and he played it like that. Yeah. That's very cool. Thank you, yes. Michael, we'll get you in just a second. Um, and so basically he says, uh, and the interviewer says, oh, but do you need to have a piano with you at that moment? He said, no, absolutely not. You must not have a real piano. You must be imagining yourself kinesthetically in relationship to the piano that you're trying to invoke. Because it's a gesture. Yes. It's and gestural it, at that Yes. At that so, in fact, many musicians practice w away from their instruments yeah. with, you know, the, the haptic. Well, that's just it. Our mind, it, our fingers are really part of our mind, you know, yeah. maybe not part of our brain, but mind is different. So I, I feel like these are all connected in terms of the relationship between the, the physicality of being and what kind of mind is produced mm -hmm. and where you would intercede to break habit. Mm -hmm. um, and I could invoke Carlos Castaneda there, but I won't. But I know that Michael wants to, uh, wants to jump in here. Michael. I, first of all, thank you. I just want to say there's a lot here <laughs> and, uh, my comment actually came, I don't even know, five, 10 minutes ago to the works on closed time like curves. Uh, and, you know, as a looping guitarist, you know, as someone who has uh, emphasized site specific improvisation in environments where the uh, you know, you, it was just, uh, often playing at electronic music festivals, you're the only person there with a guitar, and I'm I'm like in a weird acoustic uh, loop that the sound engineers are unfamiliar with, where they you know they they have me sitting in front of the DJ booth on the subwoofers, <laughs> you know, so that the the uh, there's bone conduction yeah. going on. Um, where like I am figured into the, uh, the signal yeah. that the instrument is receiving and then using an EBO, you know, electromagnetic simulation of the, the, the metal strings. And, you know, so there's, there's all that spatiotemporal stuff. But like what I actually wanted to, what it wanted to speak to, uh, and then of course, Elliot, you know, uh, um, Aneta Igu and Woody Igu uh, have wanted me to connect with you for like probably 20 years. So I'm really glad this is happening. Um, but the, the time loop piece, I, I want to reference the work of Eric Wargo, who wrote a book called Time Loops, Precognition, Retrocausation, and the Unconscious. And I interviewed him on Future Fossils podcast, episode 117, and again in 171 and he has uh as the child of two clinical psychologists um and a science writer for the nsf he ha has taken it upon himself to chronicle over 20 years of dream journaling and then uh, found the work of the uh, Royal Aviator, J.W. Dunn, whose book, An Experiment with Time, was hugely influential in the uh, first half of the 20th century to 
uh, a lot of the you know the golden age science fiction authors and was generally uh a, 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 you know, it's funny there's like this whole sort of like lost uh history of people believing that we could actually foresee the future through dreams this was a very popular idea uh it was widely accepted and he believed that he had he had come across a framework for it and eric wargo has been building on john, uh, john dunn's framework for it uh and he places it in quantum mechanical processes he places it in uh you know to reference conversation yesterday in the uh free energy minimization and uh uncertainty reduction processes going on in the quantum mechanical phenomena that are, he believes, like at, uh, at the root of biological processes, that like biology itself can be understood as inherently time binding. Wow. And that that's why we, uh, you know, life has managed to, uh, and you know, in, in concordance with University of, of Surrey biologist John Joe McFadden, whose book Quantum Evolution proposes a very similar thing that that the uh, the exceeding improbability of the complexity of a living cell was uh, computed in a, a quantum hyperspace in a superposition and. Uh, basically bootstrapped itself into existence mm. and that you know Wargo's idea has been that this this process uh, which exists you know in a kind of like it's uh, Roger Penrose Stuart Hameroff sense you know in the microtubules of eukaryotic cells um, that this is going on in the brain and that the the brain has learned to uh, Carry, carry this forward at a much higher uh, harmonic or, or order of magnitude. And that we are actually inherently, all of us, uh, precognitive beings, but that we tend to throw out our precognitive experiences because they do not comport with our known, yes. our, our training data. Our known experience. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so he said dream journaling is essential in this process because it requires us, uh, it requires, it, it, it's, a, it's a diligence and uh, uh, an objectivity where, you know, before you, you trash bin something that seems irrelevant, you write it down and then you find out a year later that you had been dreaming about a, a room that you had never been in before and people you'd never met. And you're like, oh yeah, that was, I, I did actually, that, that came to pass. And he's spoken with thousands and thousands of, of people about this. And his, his uh, follow-up book is uh, much more on the, the anecdotal body, but yeah, there is, there's a strong quantum mechanical thing about this, uh, in the, you know, the delayed choice experiment by John Wheeler, the work of Yahira Haranoff. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a, uh, it's, and, and I had the luxury. The last thing I'll say is I had the, I had the privilege of speaking with Ted Chang about this at the Santa Fe Institute when I was still employed with them a year ago and uh, they, uh, he, they brought him on as a Miller scholar. And we had a, a rather fraught conversation about free will um, because it turns out that Ted uh, has written all of this, you know, arrivals and there's, uh, I forget the other one, the, the story that he wrote Story of your life. With the button that knows you're going to push it, yeah. uh, but he he he's deeply disquieted by the fact that 
uh, but you know, by the by the this, this possibility that this could be the case and has expressed it in his fictions in the way that Lovecraft expressed his own horrors or Giger expressed his own horrors in, in his work uh, as a way of kind of like getting them out of his mind and onto a substrate. Um, and so I think it's funny because I think Ted, Ted is actually a, a, a prophet um, but he's not willing to, to wrangle with the metaphysical implications. Uh, he, he's, he's very uncomfortable with what it means to suggest that we, um, you know, <clears throat> we're not, that, you know, we're, we're involved in tautological processes and that we, uh, you know, he, he wants to preserve agency and responsibility mm -hmm. in that. And I think that's, uh, uh, you know, it's obviously important that we do. Um, and we must, you know, we must, I mean, and, uh, that's uh, the vein in, in Vonnegut's work as well. You know, um, a, a responsibility <clears throat> does not, uh, it, this, none of this is obviating the accountability of the actor, the, you know, the, the, the agent itself. But, you know, here we are. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Mike, Michael, I want to invite Gabriel Montes to jump in also, if Gabe is still with us. Um, mm -hmm. Because I know that not only is, uh, is Gabe a neuroscientist, but he also has some time constraints. So if he's still with us, I think that that would be a a great segue to um, to pull him in. If he's not with us, then uh... yep, Gabriel is here. Gabriel's here. All right, there's Gabe. Gabe, you know, uh, I just want to follow up on what Michael was saying because in looking at Hameroff and Penrose and the notion that, um, and I remember reading in Curse in Kurzweil, I think it was probably his Singularity is Near book him making a napkin sketch kind of forecast that if human intelligence emerges out of the neuron to neuron connections, then you, you know, we'll have a few decades before we can actually capture and simulate. But if it emerges from microtubule um, quantum interactions, then it'll just be a couple of orders of magnitude more difficult. Um, and he was kind of saying that it, it, it won't be that big of a lift to go beyond the neuron to neuron challenge to the microtubule challenge. And so that's one concept that I want to float out there that I'm pretty sure um, Gabe, Troy, and Michael, you folks on the Zoom call are familiar with, but I think a number of people in this room here are as well. And the second thing that I wanted to float, Gabe, to you from Michael is this question of temporality because Nandita's talk brought up temporality both in Arrival um, and also potentially in the way that the, the word and the sign and the symbol function. And I'm thinking there of William S. Burroughs, and you know, David, you and I, David Roden That's and I were talking about Burroughs earlier today. I'm, I'm thinking about Burroughs and Brian Geisen's cut up process. I'm thinking about the way that that was intentionally um, deployed to uh, subvert rational thought, to you know, destroy narrative constraint and linearity. Yeah. And uh, I wanna try to find a connection between those ideas of temporality, uh, a little bit closer to hard science of neurophysiology, whether it's the neuron-neuron or the microtubule process. I want to approach this question in relationship to the mind flow state that Elliot was talking about, where the, the conscious mind becomes just a kind of like a, a caretaker or an observer of a whole series of processes while something else is going on when we're involved in this act of music as a, as a set of jumping off points for you. So Gabe. Yeah, um, thank you, Ed, and thank you, everyone. Really beautiful stuff. So, yeah, there, there's a lot to synthesize. Um, and my sort of gut response to to these, um, these prompts and everything that has been said is similar to what I keep coming back to from the very beginning of this uh, roundtable, which was when... Ed, really, I think you came and talked about encountering AI as an alien. 
um, and sort of that was the framing of it, which is interesting because I think, you know, a lot of folks may even see AI as more human or more somehow relatable to our intelligence than otherwise. But regardless, the way I sort of fall into this is I feel there's a huge importance on the encounter. So when we encounter uh, another person, um, whether it's, you know, it's someone from our, the culture, similar ethnicity we grew up in, or it's an alien, there is that moment where there is a gap and there's an opportunity to embrace that gap. Um, and sort of, you know, my, my background and passion is a neuroscientist, musician, and also a sort of mind hacking uh, enthusiast of consciousness and various wisdom traditions. There is a, uh, a mudra or a gesture in uh, non-dual Tibetan Buddhism, which is um, basically something that practitioners do to kind of help them get into a non-dual state. And it's actually to literally drop their jaw and relax their tongue and l smile while you're dropping your tongue and let that drop your belly at the same time. So you kind of settle into a nervous system state of suspended breath, suspended animation, and you're just sort of in this 360 kind of embrace. And when I think about the encounter with something alien, and this is kind of how I think about my encounters with people too, from this place of fundamental curiosity, this sort of serotonergic kind of uh, interest and curiosity and welcoming is like a, oh, wow. You know, just so there's just taking a step back and opening and seeing where the connections can be. Because uh, Michael mentioned something of free energy minimization, right? So this is in neuroscience, you have the, the Bayesian brain hypothesis, which is that we're constantly trying to minimize um, uncertainty and that our brains uh, through our learned experience, we form priors, and then these are then projections and uh, and predictions about what will happen in the future, um, speaking of temporality. And whenever something doesn't match our model or our models that we have, there is a prediction error that shoots up the, from the spinal cord up into the cortex and different parts of the nervous system. And what the nervous system tries to do uh, consciously and unconsciously in different ways is to resolve and sort of, sort of a terminate um, that prediction error. So we either adjust our perception or we correct something with uh, motorically or verbally to order to match what our model is if we don't want our model to change. In encountering something and that embracing this uh, unknown aspect, I feel there's a, there's a, a, a sublime appreciation for the moment to moment um, sort of uh, chirotic or chironic experience that is seeing how can I sort of get out of my wherever I'm coming from and understand where this thing in front of me that I'm beholding and my perception is coming from. And so for that, I take a step back and I only try to grok non-linguistically. So that could be pre-linguistically, translinguistically, wh whatever, or all at the same time. There's an aspect of baffling, of being baffled by by this encounter. And I think the point of, I'm trying to make is stepping back in that way allows interesting things to emerge that are not necessarily in the model that I come into a situation with as, you know, just as a human being, as an organism. So, you know, neuroscientifically, we've got all these senses on our head, you know, ears, eyes, nose, and so on. And it's no coincidence that, you know, these senses are converging in one place. And since we're born or even gestationally and beforehand, you can even argue, we, these senses are converging in the same place and they're creating an evergreen statistic, which is basically physical locationality in space. So you're almost creating the notion of 3D space because things are happening. They're happening in a way that feels like it's happening to something that thing that is experiencing must be something, it must be a me. So let me then start stitching together these experiences as a static entity over time. So it's like, it's really just a process of selfing over and over and over, but it is really useful for 
um, reducing uncertainty in life to create a model of a static self. So this is this is um, quite quite interesting, you know, um, that we kind of emerge from this pre-spatial soup of open pluripotent temporality, and then from there a static self seems to emerge, and then somehow this gets more and more stuck through life as our model hardens. And of course, some things are good to you know uh, useful to be to have models about, like don't touch the hot stove because then you're really inconvenienced, right? Um, but other things, being in a model can be quite con constraining uh, to being in a sort of grokking mode where you might be encountering a being, an AI, an alien, an entity, let's say, that has a totally different cognitive morphology to you. Um, think of octopi, you know, their senses are distributed in a really funky way. The neuroscience of this has been studied uh, you know, to the best of our ability. And it's quite different from having a central nervous system versus a distributed nervous system. And so where is your sense of self there? How how are the senses converging? What are the spectrum of frequencies in each sense? What modality are you in? All these are dials and parameters in the sort of central console of some entity that we are, we are encountering. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the... The way AI is shaping up to be now is, um, it's sort of like, it's sort of um, a, a new cortex based upon, you know, everything that you humanity has generated. We're sort of creating a new cortex for a new being, and maybe in five or ten years, this 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 entity, this thing will, uh, regardless of whether it's conscious or not, it will start kind of bootstrapping itself and start developing meta levels that are that are then can reflect back on its you know, lower cortices, and who knows exactly where it's going. We could talk about this um, all day long. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, let, let me pause there, but there's really a lot to say. I guess one more thing is you mentioned that, yeah, so being a musician, so I, I try to personally, um, I not that I try, but I find myself one of the best ways I can just jump on a stage and be there with as least effort as possible is to kind of take the biggest step back and find the the space where everything around me makes sense immediately and then where where is my place in that so um i can be a small fractal in, in that in that space but find the common denominatorship with all the phenomena that are existing and then emerge from that rather than sort of the rock being a rock in the rock tumbler of what's going on so you know that's how i see the the other stuff as well i think he's taking mm. yeah that's awesome gabe thanks yeah yeah the the continuous process of selfing is very i think that's very interesting there because i guess we could we could ask the question what are the the kind of uh, mechanisms that are responsible for that one theme that came up a little bit yesterday was the question of the the extended almost like an extended phenotype uh social culturally economically politically which would be inseparable from that process of ongoing selfing or ongoing constitution of a, a, a you know a kind of a social political um, collective and obviously if people share a particular culture like they like a particular kind of dance or a particular kind of music then it's the individual it's the indivi individuation it's a collective there's an external process which is the listening to the music which each individual does but it's a kind of a it's a system with its own in, uh, momentum and its feedback own rule set feedback yeah. loops thank you elliot yeah yeah so I, I guess one of the questions here becomes a question on, on two scales one again to drive this back to the the question of what it means to import some of these insights into the design of ai and of course, to a greater or lesser extent, we're all involved in that project. But Gabe, of course, working with SingularityNet, is working with it quite specifically on some projects. Um, and the second question is to put this into the larger cosmological framework once again. Uh, because Arrival does, and Dune, as you mentioned, Nandita does. Uh, but this is part of the, the kind of broader question of cosmic brain. And, um, and in, Peter, in Peter Watts's work, of course, this larger question of what typologies of mind, sentience, and sapience there are, and what the relationships might be between them. So again, I want to I kind of try to jump scales from 
at the local scale of the human, one person who every day gets up and enters the process of selfing and repeats that and selfs and selfs and selfs. You know, that was a handy, beautiful insight, Gabriel, for that one. And then think about what it means for an AI to be able to self. So what are the processes by which an AI would self? And are there ways that the gesture or the musical state that Elliot was talking about can really be imported. You know, and one way that I was thinking over the past year was simply to try to work with the people who are tokenizing gesture and tokenizing sound. Um, and perhaps that is a way forward, but I wonder if there isn't a better or a more radical way of doing it that will import some of the value of the insights of the shadow casting 4D to 3D, 3D to 2D that Nandita was talking about. Um, I mean, I suppose we could look at ecosystems. I suppose we could look at really unusual states of perception. Um, I guess I'm more inclined to, to the ecosystem approach because I have a skepticism about the usefulness of an individual state of bliss, for example. You know, like texts of bliss versus texts of pleasure. Um, and bliss actually, well, bliss is used in a critical way when you start thinking about that, that concept uh, in a good way. But a state of rapture, if I feel like I'm in a flow state, of course it feels good, and of course I strive for it, and I don't get it very much, but I don't really trust it to be reporting back to me something that's good. I mean, Elliot, I remember talking to you a few years ago about, and I, I told this anecdote yesterday, you come out of a gig, you felt great during the gig, you listened to the recording, right. and it wasn't happening. But you can come out of another gig where it, it felt really tough, and you listen to it, and you realize, wow, there was a lot of really interesting interplay happening there. So I'm skeptical of the flow state, even though it feels great and I seek it. And I wonder, well, should we be trying to design systems that have flow states or systems that are skeptical of flow states or maybe systems that are agile and they can be both into flow states but skeptical of them? We're agile. Yep. Why not a system? Why, why not, why not, why not a system? Why not create a system? Yep. I mean, whether or not it can model our own agility in terms of interpreting states. This is the question. And that goes back to your question for... For Gabriel? Gabriel, about yeah. just the physiology of microtubes versus... Yeah. Yeah. You know, in terms of the cosmological, yes. we might just look at the entire universe. I mean, given the nature of quantum states as just a giant probability calculator. And it's just a very high probability that we are sitting here at this moment and that we will continue <laughs> sitting here through the length or, or, not, or, or not, you know. And, and maybe our minds, our, our, our bigger minds in terms of how they work when we enter a flow state is just connecting with the probability machine on a base level. The notion of luck means listening to the probability machine that we exist in and seeing that little bit of the future and say, yes, that makes sense and acting on it or not acting on it. Yeah. Just anecdotally, that reminds me of a film and someone else will have to remember the title of the film because it's escaping me now. It's a kind of a B film that looks at the concept that there are certain people who have orders of magnitude more luck than others. And there's a secret society of people who do competitions they find the people who have tons of luck and they put them in these unbelievably dangerous situations and the people who have enough luck can survive them. Like the, you'll be blindfolded and you'll be running through a forest in the middle of the night. And if you can run through the forest and not you know, run into a tree and kill yourself, then you, know, you can move on to the next round. Was the name of this film Intacto? It was, right? Yeah. Uh, very, very, very interesting concept there. I mean, it, it's, it's a, definitely a B movie. It doesn't get really deeply into what we're, we're talking about here. But the question of probability and minimizing uncertainty, which was a concept that came up yesterday again, and Peter was talking about Friston in, in this concept, in this context, I think is, is all relevant to what we're talking about. You, you could say that the temporality of a next generation large language model, like let's say a chat GPT-6, like a really next generation one that never hallucinates mm. is a different temporality than ChatGPT4, which does have these charming hallucinations right now. Just like you and I 
have charming hallucinations. I'm not high right now, but I certainly am perceiving the world in an unusual way, which is not uh, ground truth. <laughs> My ground truth is subjective, and as much as I attempt to make it objective, I can't. So I wonder about the temporality of an LLM that doesn't ever hallucinate, because it would be enormously useful for engineering next generation materials and curing various illnesses, but it would also have an Achilles heel somehow built into it. Uh, Troy, I know that you've been looking into this a bit. That's, that's the setup? <laughs> into, uh, into, into LLMs that don't hallucinate? Yeah. Sorry, Ed, could, yeah, Ed, could you hear me? What, what's the, uh, could you maybe just say a little bit more? Are you talking about the LLMs that don't hallucinate? Well, I was talking about LLMs that don't hallucinate, but I was trying to link it back to a question of, um, of health and using certain kinds of practices, because of course health strives for a predictable outcome, just like much of science strives for a predictable outcome. We don't want to engineer an airplane that has a, very low chance of making it to the destination. Um, we want to guarantee as much as possible with orders of magnitude, of sigma, that it will get to its destination properly and safely. And so I, I feel like there's an interesting tension here in relationship to exploring questions of health and guaranteeing health and guaranteeing certain outcomes versus the temporality of a locked-in future, uh, uh, a guaranteed future, a future which um, within which uncertainty has been minimized. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> it's so nice to be in this conversation. My God. We, we got to start with Schwaller de Lubit, so I'm, uh, I've been all in from the beginning. Um, it's interesting. <clears throat> it brings to mind this, the difference between curing and healing. Um, and I think of curing as sort of like the goal of yeah, the basic goal of a kind of allopathic medical approach, which sort of treats the body as like a, as like an old car that you can pop open and understand and change the gaskets and fix. Um, and that's, you know, that's a pretty ungenerous understanding, but I think that's still the kind of metaphysics that underlies it, um, where you literally, you cure something, you fix it, it's broken, you fix it, versus healing, uh, which I think of as sort of like going on a journey to reframe your relationship to disease. Um, and so you, for example, uh, somebody with a terminal illness can't be cured, but they could be healed. Um, they could change their relationship to, uh, to the nature of death and, and what's coming. Um, and so like, if you wanted an AI bot to act as your allopathic doctor, your drug dealer to tell you, you know, what what uh, gasket to change or what what uh, mRNA pill to take or something like that, then you'd want an LLM that wouldn't hallucinate because you would have a deterministic model of both the knowledge base and the body and its reaction to whatever you're gonna put into it. Um, versus healing, you would actually, you'd wanna sort of like find, you'd wanna like tune the hallucination. Um, you'd want a system that would hallucinate, a system that could be kind of creative and nonlinear. Um, in the same way, I really, I really appreciate the, this introduction of the, the idea of gesture that, um, um, Nandita. that Nandita gave. It made me think about the way that um, sh some shamanic traditions, when they, well, actually, to, to be more academic about it, maybe, um, there's a book by a Canadian scholar, Canada-based scholar, named uh, Edward Cohn, uh, called How Forests Think. And he talks about the way that uh, cultures that work with, for example, ayahuasca, plant medicines, and so on, um, when they change their state of consciousness, the way that they kind of dredge or kind of or, or port information back across the the kind of transition zone of states of consciousness when you go kind of into a altered state and then come back, um, instead of using literal language, they use metaphor, um, because metaphor is sort of polyvalent, um, and by using metaphor. Uh, 
you can kind of preserve some of the higher dimensional or multidimensional polyvalent nature of the information on the other side, which doesn't really kind of conformally map onto our you know, linguistic three-dimensional plus time kind of experience. Um, and so he has this like really simple kind of structure, which is like within one state of consciousness, you speak literally, and then between states of consciousness or between kind of worlds, you speak metaphorically, um, which I think... I'm curious, like what the what what Nandita in particular thinks about gesture versus metaphor, mm -hmm. um, if they would occupy asking, kind of like yeah. the same territory. Yeah, What's yeah. That? No, that's a very good question, and I it's one I asked yeah. myself, because you know, in some senses, metaphor as well as allegory and and things like that. Um, but I would say that metaphor and allegory are still within the regime of the sign, even mm -hmm. if. Um, metaphor is also mobile, um, strictly speaking. Metaphorine is, you know, to, to carry over, right? So it's a mobile um, entity, but I would say that it is, so it shares with gesture that mobility, but I think metaphor is, it's probably the closest thing you can get to gesture within the a linguistic system, which um, which is always oriented um, towards uh, transfiction. Although, you know, even with um, even with language, you do have the play of language. So there is a little bit of indeterminacy in language. But um, you know, it's like it, it makes me think of Kant. You know. Kant's idea of the concept, the word is begriff, to grasp, right? And so I think that metaphor, although it's mobile, still part of the system, at least the way we're familiar with it, uh, if still f part of a linguistic system that seeks to grasp things. Mm. Whereas gesture cannot be grasped, but it can be arrested momentarily in a diagram. So, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the two systems are different, but the mobility, the kind of volatility of metaphor, as well as the volatility of gesture, is similar. It kind of operates within its own system in, a simi in an analogous way. So, yeah. I still see metaphor as um, linguistic. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just say one one thing on that. I really appreciate the response, and it's interesting you bring that. Of course, it's like the German Kant who wants to, to grasp. Yes, yes, he does. Um, and I'm, I kind of feel like I, I typically use metaphor when I want to caress or I want to stay or hold. So it's sort of like when you want to kind of like come into relation with something without scaring it off, almost like taming a wild animal or something. Um, where you want to kind of have it settle so that you can be in relation, but you also know you're not going to tame it. You're not going to grasp it. You're not going to put it in the cage. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I, I'm curious if there's, I, I liked the, when Ed asked you earlier about the relationship, like the, the thing that I sketched in my notebook was like gesture, diagram, and then sign. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if there's, you know, if that linear axis also has a, another second axis, right? such that metaphor allows, it can be sort of like more adjacent adjacent to ge uh, to gesture yeah. while still being within the realm of, of symbol or something. Because I think yeah. that that would yeah. be where I'd get excited about kind of like reopening, you know, Schwaller's corpus or something like that yeah. um, is yeah. like, could you read it again 60, 70 years later um, with some of the things that we now know from other wisdom traditions around the world that are not just the Western, Western esoteric one. Um, and uh, in the way that different cultures use both, wis or both gesture and metaphor. And I'm curious if that would be like a way of kind of like cracking open the Schwaller corpus again, because I think it's really, it's really fertile. I do too. I do too. And I've been trying to crack that corpus for a long time. It's, it's very fascinating. And I think it's totally underread. So I completely, well, I encourage you to do that. And Schwaller's approach to hieroglyphics is very uh, odd. It's not at all the, you know, the commonplace way of 
looking at hieroglyphs. So, um, but I think he's on to something. I, I think he's on to something. I mean, one thing that occurred to me while you were speaking is I think there would be ways in which their, you know, metaphor and gesture share some um, operations. Let's put it that way. They have a, like, for example, I was thinking both metaphor and gesture seem to have a propagational effect. They, they propagate um, somehow. The, the motion has a fertility to it, you know. Mm. Um, it's not just a motion that kind of cuts across something without leaving traces and um, effects. So, mm. uh, you know, I, it, mm. Perhaps you can, like, maybe it's just a matter of saying that the way I've discussed it today, metaphor is still a 3D, it's still within the 3D system that we have. But maybe, you know, and gesture is not. Gesture seems to touch or encounter, that's the word we were using. Gesture seems, the system in which gesture uh, lives, dwells, um, seems to be one which permits a 4D understanding. Hmm. Maybe, may, maybe metaphor does too. I just haven't gotten to that point yet. And t to me, they're they're different right now as opposed to similar. But I do see that they have similar operations within their own uh, respective systems. Hmm. So propagation. Uh, that's great. I was just, just one thing to add when you were speaking. I was wondering to to, give, uh, to Gabriel's comment earlier about mudras and gesture. Mm -hmm. Like, could there be a kind of like correlate of the way that like of gesture to mudra? What would be again? Metaphor? This is a very good question and something I've pondered a lot because I I'm an Indian classical dancer, so our mm -hmm. our vocab dance vocabulary is made up entirely of gesture. Um, Mm. Or, or, or mudras. And I mean, I think the way I see it is this. A mudra can be a gesture, but the minute we code it, it becomes a language. Mm. I think it's the coding of the gesture that turns it into uh, or, or ropes it into the linguistic system. So mm. like, for example, when I do mudras, you know, this is a flag. Um, you know, this is an arrow. The code makes it mm. linguistic, whereas without mm. that coding, pre-code, it is, it is, the mudra is gestural, I think. So, yeah. so, yeah. yeah, so that's kind of how I've, it's, it sounds very rudimentary, I know. I mean, I mean I'm, at that, I'm at the rudimentary stage of this at the moment, but yeah. So I think, you know, I think when I, really when in, in Bharatanatyam, when we dance, we use our mudras to tell stories, to uh, mm -hmm. make meaning. And to me, that's linguistic. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank so you isn't it much. like creating a multi-layered organism? It can't exist without all the layers simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, the gesture comes from looking at actions. Yes. And then the question is how fine a time frame are you putting in? Is this gesture different from this gesture, from this one, or are they all the same, but just by degree? And it's like yeah. animating, animating in yeah, reverse. Yeah, yeah, frame by frame, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, um, well, there's a fluidity to the gesture, so. I'm sure you could, I guess you could deconstruct it, but Put it in reverse. But, but then it would be maybe that there are a bunch of gestures that are entangled with one another. So if you were to kind of dis, you know, decouple them, you'd see that there are in fact a bunch of gestures that kind of, you know, rope onto, you know, they kind of fly together. I don't know. <laughs> are, are they taught orally? Or are they written down? Is there a visualization of the... They are taught orally, but... To learn them, we we either draw, we use drawings or note certain. We develop our own notation. Right. Um, so so they're diagrams. 
Are, are you familiar with Levin notation? That was kind yes. of big in the 70s, uh, yes. so for dance. Yeah, we never used that notation, but it's similar yeah. to that um, notation system. Um, I mean, like, looking at how you're talking about how the like, gesture moving through um, uh, four dimensions, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, how that uh, works with mudras and mm -hmm. how they could be, um, you know, like uh, a bunch of different gestures like mm -hmm. roped together into mm -hmm. uh, a larger thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes me think of animation, right? And like yes, the idea yes, of uh, right. what happens with uh, in betweening. Mm -hmm. So, you, but you take all these separate frames, and in order to create the the spaces in between, you actually uh, do this process that's called in betweening that creates all the frames that are in between a key moment and another. And and that uh, the in betweening whatever is carrying. Um, the degrees that go between one uh, specific gesture and another, this space of transition, is where that where that uh, fluidity through time yes. takes place. Yeah, that's right. That's the yes. There's yeah, a that makes sense. there's yeah there's an interesting question. I I tried to ask uh, ChatGPT a few months ago <laughs> if it had any opinions about the different forms of mathematics that would either be used by or emerge from a living organism or an ecosystem, a tree or a forest. Mm -hmm. And the reason I bring this up, it didn't have a very good answer. It, it did one of its kind of hedging answers, which, which effectively, um, I can find the conversation maybe and share it later, but it basically said, this is a fascinating idea and deep research can be done about this, but those, those, the, those um, systems don't use math. And I, I, I tried to tease it into, thinking about embedded mathematics and logic systems. But in any case, the reason I bring this up is because of a structure for um, quantizing and step um, metricizing uh, systems that we usually think of as continuous processes. You know, and I remember having a really funny argument conversation with the architect Carl Chu um, about continuous being versus quantized being. Uh, and Carl, if I remember correctly, and if I don't, he'll be very mad at me mm -hmm. because he, he can get quite agitated. But he was arguing for the kind of fundamental baseline step-by-step -step nature of, of our universe. That continuity is, is not real. There's no such thing as real continuity, analog continuity, but that be because it would lead to absolute infinity in everything. Everything would have an infinity in it. And that, and but that's it. And that that's is it. That's the point. <laughs> because if you, it, sorry. No, no. No, I was just going to say, if you choose that model, it becomes the model of chronos, of, chrono, of chronological time. Yes, chronos versus ion versus kairos. But Julieta, I wanted to bring this back to you because you were talking about this step-by-step this -step animation mm -hmm. and the betweening. And I, I, I wanted to ask this question around where the betweening happens in existing systems, natural systems, and what kind of value we can pull out of that. Because if everything is analog and continuous, then all of the tweening in betweening is a kind of an artificial framework that we install, or not, not just us, but that systems install upon themselves or in negotiation in with other systems. Yeah. Only in the perception. Only in the perception, perception of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I okay. think a lot of it is perception, a lot of things is like, it's predictive almost. Yep. And that a lot of that uh, in-betweening and tweaking, it's, uh, it's uh, something that gets used in the creation of models, like of intelligent models, right? There is a lot of, uh, how do you get, like uh, how a uh, chat GPT gets from one thing to another if it is not in betweening, yeah? Like how am I going to modulate? I mean, like there is this, uh, you have probably seen it, the conversation, this ongoing conversation between, uh, is it Zizek and Herzog that, are, that have been talking through chat GPT for the last year? Oh, oh right. it's ongoing. It's ongoing, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, like the way to produce this, um, uh, you know, on the spirit of Herzog or on the spirit of Zizek conversations is by a uh, mm. constant in between, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's, that would be the answer. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, um, yeah prediction. If, if, how do you fill, it, fill in the gaps with something that is not junk? That is not what? That is not junk, right? Ah, okay, yeah. So yeah. the filling in the gaps with sense is what that in-betweening is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, in AI, as you were talking about asking it and hedging it, 
it's drawing upon a database of things that are entered into it or that it is acquired. So, and I hate to quote war criminal Donald Rumsfeld, but he had a brilliant thing that and he was laughed at by everybody. The question of the, there are known knowns mm -hmm. and, and unknown, unknown unknowns, unknowns. Yeah. and the unknown unknowns yeah. are not showing up in, at least as far as I know, yep. I don't. But. Yep. but that goes back to bafflement, um, which I think Gabriel, was, Gabriel talking was talking about bafflement, yeah. Because in some senses, you know, if we as 3D or even if we were 2D creatures encountering 3D or 3D encountering 4D, we would basically see something appear, but not a whole thing, just mm -hmm. like a line or an edge of something and then disappear. And so really the encounter with the 4D, you know, uh, realm, for us 3D creatures would always be bafflement. We would not, it would resist making sense to us. Or we filter them out because of uh, it. Fil but well, we couldn't, we couldn't even identify what. But, but that's just it, they yeah. happen and exactly. it's something that doesn't fit in. Did we see in. that? Did we, right, exactly. did it exist? So we I think I hallucinated something, maybe I had too much coffee or not enough, something like that, right? So. That happens in Flatland, right? So and that happens in yeah, Flatland I'm, too. I'm just like thinking, like remembering, like of course we have built a model of the world where we have um, understanding, right? Like mm -hmm. this is how the world is. These are the parameters that we use to move from here to there. And the moment that something comes in and uh, shows that our parameters are, you know, not sufficient, exactly. not enough, not wide yes. enough, uh, yes. narrow totality, however we want to uh, yeah. see them. Yeah. Um, it becomes dangerous for, for, the, for that model of the world, right? So, but I remember in Flatland, there's something that becomes heretical and somebody's yeah. about to be killed or yeah. go to jail or something <laughs> along those lines. I'm but, like recalling yeah. the, um, just because of what happens when yeah. the model of the world is proved to be a model, right? Yeah. The, mm. Yes. Mm. Or they haven't yes. finished building it. Yeah, and I mean, all of a sudden exactly. you see, More well, and very much in like, a, a, mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember which Philip K. Dick novel, where all of a sudden you can see that the construction is not so good and, and the seams are showing and the labeling. It's and, time out of joint. Yes. It's so mm -hmm. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, time out of joint. Yeah. I see Gabriel wants to jump in on this one. Gabe? Yeah, great, great discussion. Um, so there was a, in the Philip K. Dick novel of uh, Ballas, there was, um, Ballas, yeah. there was a, there was a, um, a metaphor that I'll just never forget. Um, he was talking about, uh, so was, you know, an, an alien force or entity can show up, but be camouflaged. So all we would see is like the stripes of a zebra mm -hmm. and we kind of yes. write it off as a zebra, yes. but it's actually something else. Yes. Um, Good. And as, how how often do we write things off mm -hmm. as being, you know, in the realm of the familiar, you know, this, the 4D encroaching and we see it as 3D and, and that's right. these kinds of things. Oh, that, that's just a shadow, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I, this could happen quite a lot. And this is why um, I, I remember even when the, just, you know, the, over a decade ago, I think just when, when, you know, I remember at some point thinking about unidentified uh, un, um, UAPs, unidentified aero phenomena, UFOs, and so on. And a lot of people are very interested in the sort of the, the physical, you know, object and uh, grays and aliens. And I thought, well, if there is such an advanced civilization that could theoretically be already embedded psychically in our reality, mm -hmm. and we may or may not know, but it, it may be something we constantly write off um, as something else, you know, yeah. just as a thought experiment. Um, and now um, there is a mention of, of uh, animation frames. So um, there's this technique um, called the microphenomenological interview or the elicitation interview that was used, uh, developed by a French fellow, a, regretfully do not remember his name, but it was um, when a job in management and leadership was being handed over to somebody else, they would interview someone in great detail about how they made decisions and then use that to train the new person. And this uh, became something that has now been taught as a, as a sort of a cognitive microscope as a tool. So it's a second person uh, method to probe um, the mind and cognition. It's called microphenomenology. And um, I was in a training for this and I had someone 
demonstrating the technique on me and asking me questions. So the way it is, is basically, you know, uh, recall any experience or someone would just go up to you and clap their hands in front of your face and ask you, you know, what did you experience? And I would have a response and then it, it would kind of get to this point of the questions, whereas, okay, and, th and then what happened? What happened after you experienced that? And how do you know that that's what you experienced? And how do you know that you know? And what feeling is that? And it, it gets your mind to, you know, if you don't throw up your hands um, when they're asking you these things and you're really just kind of settling into the question, there's a dilation that happens. So in the context of, of, of me, just to use that example, was uh, someone was asking me about um, how I, you know, how I, it was something in my childhood. And the more questions they asked me, the more I dilated my awareness and I saw the causality that led to a pretty ingrained behavioral pattern in my personality that's been persistent over my whole life. But I saw the actual sort of the roots of it and how it all started when I was, you know, eight years old or something like this. Um, and and it was kind of a teary moment for me to kind of feel that because it was emotional. That's just one example. Most most examples are rather mundane, but um, these are the kind of like frames that are missing, I think, because they don't, they're kind of kept sort of in the unconscious and they don't necessarily make it into um, some conventional lexicon that we need in every everyday life. So they can be, they can be put underground, they can be subterranean. Um, and, but somehow the way that a person re may relate to reality through their mental and emotional constitution is very much informed by these uh, throwaway frames that were there, but they somehow didn't, they didn't receive some codification yeah. and get plastered into the identity that we see ourselves as yeah. now. Yeah. And maybe, maybe they did for a little while, maybe for a few years, we may have remembered that, but then they, they leveled, you know, they, they fell off. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of things we forget, for example, as we, uh, have to make a living for ourselves in the world, right? The, yeah. Just, you know, leaving the nest and so on and so forth is a whole new mode and being a parent if someone's a parent. There's a lot of things where there's new concepts and then you relate to part of your life as it was a past life. So there's uh, just that comment about the animation. Um, I think there's a lot lost in there. And um, one last comment, just to jump around about mudras. So, um, you know, th there is entire mudras for like um, like a Ganesha mudra or something, right? So you'll just put your hands in a certain way and hold them that way. Mm -hmm. And there's a, in a way, they're evocative mm -hmm. of the spirit of the deity and all it represents, or let's just say the cosmology and mythology of the deity um, at an outer layer. But they're also an object, an object of contemplation, right? So I don't necessarily need to figure out what it is, but I can behold it and let it sort of just have its effect. And it may have just an iota of effect today or this week, but over a year of doing it, it might do something else. And it's kind of alchemical, uh, you know, it might be different for me than for someone else, but it's not necessarily something in, um, that may needs to be coded, although an expert could explain it, and it, you know, if you know what I mean. But but the the idea of it is to kind of um approach it with fresh eyes mm -hmm. and if i could just um finish with this point is uh, about the hallucinations and the gbt so it, this really reminds me of this um movement in psychedelic medicine with entheogens to create psychedelic compounds that do not produce hallucinations right this is kind of a little bit of an obsession in sort of um clinical medicine and academia and uh one wonders exactly what the effect of that would be. Sure, if, if more people get some benefit, wh why not, right? But it, it, one wonders if hallucinations are the sine qua non of something that is really crucial for the ultimate benefit, which may or may not be measurable um, with the clinical tools that are being employed to kind of derive these effects. So, um, it, with GPT, you know, um, as kind of Troy was mentioning, you know, there's, there's, you, from a utilitarian perspective, there's benefits, um, it seems, to, to, a, to a bit of each approach, you know. Um, from a neuroscientific standpoint, I, I remember 
this is a, a while ago now in, in 2010 i did you know my master's thesis on um how you know the visual system in the brain evolved to allow us to bootstrap neuroaesthetic perception and at some point i studied sort of the the neurobiology of like alex gray's art and how you he during psychedelic experiences as a portion of the thesis there was other things too like you know mona lisa and monet and stuff but what what produces these sort of spider webby um impressions and shapes in, in perception and it's almost like a, there's a, a mass collective inhibition and disinhibition of different neuronal networks that end up producing sort of flashes of the neural networks in a way that produce these visual phenomena, almost like just pressing against your eyes and you see these, um, you see these sort of uh, phosphines um, or, or the, the pressure. So it has that kind of a feeling um, if you're not familiar with that kind of experience. But in that kind of phenomena, there is a sort of perhaps a, an acupuncture, a, a cognitive or emotional acupuncture that happens by activating the network in that way that would otherwise not have such an effect. So uh, th there's a lot of questions about, you know, what what is it that we should pull out of the inherent sort of function of something? If something is naturally ho causing hallucinations or hallucinogenic, uh, we might want to inquire about what that is and what that means and can we create different, you know, offshoots of it for different purposes and do experimentations. So, mm. yeah, just yeah. Some, some thoughts. There were a lot of follow-ups. One thing I, wa I want to do here is uh, I think we need to take a five-minute in intermission. Um, can you hold your thought, Elliot? And we'll Absolutely. And I mean, just a quick one. Yeah, yeah. She's out there, the benzene ring came yeah, to yeah. in a dream and uh, Watson, I don't remember if it was Watson or Crick saw the uh, helical form mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, where, transmissions or hallucination or mm -hmm. projection, hard to say yeah indeed I, ha I, I'm, I have a whole thread to follow mm -hmm. on hallucinations and Deleuze mm -hmm. after this but um, same same yeah and cinema and in between and yeah, frames yeah. And, uh, yeah. I'm hallucinations thinking, a lot I'm thinking of the word metacommunication Okay, meta communicate. We'll come back to that. You know, it's not communication, but mm -hmm. it is a kind of ab about communication, or you know, it's a. So, yeah, well, the 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 the, uh, the subcodes. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll pause here for five minutes for uh, a coffee like break. Um, is the cafe still open? The there's, yeah, there's the cafe <laughs> right across the uh, courtyard here. Bathroom break. Um, come back in five minutes. Okay, everybody. Um, thank you to the online Zoom participants, especially if you have to jump off. I know it's super late in the night for you, Gabriel, in Hong Kong. So uh, It was delightful to have you in this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. To Gabriel and Michael and... Yes, Troy. And Troy. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure. Thank okay. you. Yeah. of, of jump-starting us back into the conversation, I wanted to pick up on the in-betweening uh, discussion that we were having just before the break. And uh, there were two references that came to mind for me. Uh, and again, the in-betweening was in part a reference to the idea that in, in animation, you know, you have keyframes, and a keyframe might be once every five seconds, but to get it up to 30 frames per second, you have to either draw or interpolate somehow between those keyframes. There is an example from Peter Watts's Blind Sight where, and Peter, you'll correct me if I'm remembering this incorrectly, um, the humans go on board the alien whatever it is. It's a ship, it's a hive, it's a body, and they don't see any aliens there. And um, at a certain point, of course, they, they ultimately they, they start being able to see the aliens and interact with them, but initially they don't. And the explanation uh, is quite beautiful. And again, Peter, please jump in here and, and fix me if I'm messing this up. But the aliens have electromagnetic magnetically such a, a pr profound capability, they can scan the human brains in real time at like the microsecond level. 
so they can see inside the human mind and understand what the humans are perceiving. And humans, our vision has a problem in the sense that our vision has a kind of a refresh rate and a saccade. Your eyes are constantly spasming and looking around. And so, technically, in a way, your eyes only see keyframes, but it's much faster than 30 frames per second. And the aliens have the ability to see when a human is seeing a keyframe, and they only move in the in-between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did I get that right, Peter? Okay. The cool. scramblers. The scramblers. Yeah. Wow. So, the, so the aliens are kind of like, they're kind of not moving <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whenever you're looking, and then they move really quickly when you're not looking. Um, and so, you know, the notion here for me is, is it's, it's really rich and it's rife with kind of extrapolation, but it links also for me to Deleuze and his work on cinema. And one of the biggest takeaways for me from Deleuze's two books on cinema is the idea that, of course, we have the cinematic threshold and the ability <coughs> of a human being to perceive at a certain frame rate. But we have also across the history of cinema, a movement from the, the movement image, an evolution from the movement image to what Deleuze is calling the time image. And I suppose we could get into the, into the weeds about what exactly Deleuze is meaning by the time image. My sense was, and has been for, for a long time, that the time image is a kind of a synesthetic not just image, it's a sound image, space movement image. And it also has a very crucial relationship to the notions of firstness, secondness, and thirdness that the philosopher Charles Peirce unpacks in his work. And I'm far from an expert on Peirce, so I won't even attempt to talk about Peirce, but only in a secondary way through Deleuze. Deleuze uses the example of a cow being hungry and wanting to eat as an example of firstness. Um, the cow doesn't really think about being hungry or think about wanting to eat. It just is hungry and it wants to eat. An example, loosely speaking, of secondness would be you or I having a perception or a desire or a drive and mm, reflecting on the fact that we have that. An example of thirdness, and that maybe would be somewhere in the, in the realm between sentience and sapience. An example of thirdness would be a deeper reflection on reflection but also crucially a place where error creeps into the system or hallucination. And I wanted to loop back to this discussion of hallucination that we were having um, before, the, before the break. And so for me, this idea of thirdness has always been a place where a, a certain form of indeterminacy creeps into the system, which is productive indeterminacy. It's noise, it's the included third, um, it's dream, it's a kind of a dream memory state. It's the place where um, the minimization of uncertainty is undone. And uncertainty is championed for being something valuable. So in here, in this space of the discussion of the throwaway frames that Gabriel was talking about, Gabe is, I guess he's not with us anymore, but uh, the throwaway frames that Gabriel was talking about, I remembered that beautiful line from the filmmaker Chris Marker, where in, um, in La Jete, no, sorry, in, in uh, Sans Soleil, at a certain point, his narrator says uh, something along the lines of, well, actually, I, now I'm not remembering, which is great. It's either La Jete or Sans Soleil, where the, the narrative voice says, nothing sorts memories out from ordinary moments. It's only later on they claim remembrance when they show their scars. It's um, La Jete. It's La Jete, thank you, yeah. And so, this idea that we would experience reality, but not notice many things that are happening, but nonetheless be marked by them, because if I understood what Gabriel was saying, he was saying we are marked by these things that we aren't perceiving, connected to models of memory which are direct reaction, firstness, mediated or meditated reaction, reflected reaction, secondness, and reflected, reflected reaction with error built into it, which maybe would be thirdness, struck me as being crucial to the discussion that we're having about hallucination and what degrees of gesture would be useful for us to import into the design of a cognitive system? Um, and again, Elliot, you know, as a musician, um, you've talked about this a lot, and I remember years ago you talking about this in relationship to the chemical 
um, soup that essentially we're always swimming in. And you talked about this in relationship to how you understand the live performance. Well, in fact, not just live performance, all perception, not, not just music, it's, it's all about, well, let's say specifically music is psychoacoustic chemical change. I mean, everything we do affects our, our neurochemicals. I mean, we are, uh, so the question is the communication, is it in the chemicals or is the chemical just the uh, means of transmission? You know, can you separate the message from the messenger? Yeah, Lem, Lem talks about this in his master's voice and probably Summa and other places, right? The, mm -hmm. the idea of a natural language versus a, a constructed language. Yeah, in, in the Summa, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In Dune, the psychochemical change actually changes the entity. Mm -hmm. It changes, so it's not just transmission. There's a, there's a actual transfiguration well, of well, the chemical. Well, the, the relationship between performer and audience is always uh, transactional. Yeah which is why a performance in a room is very diff with people is very different from a recording of the performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the associated milieu. And especially- the recording isn't there. Some musics, you know, that, are, that are, are part of ritual are very much designed to induce chemical change, physical yeah. states of yeah. behavior. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We were just, just talking outside about the, um, the notation of uh, Macam mm -hmm. and how it actually, it was uh, for um, Western musicologists, it was really difficult to understand how uh, Middle Eastern music was supposed to sound. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, that at some point it was said, you know, like those people play uh, to the best of their abilities, but they are not too, so good because it, it they're simply- They're out of tune or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah. they're out of, completely out of tune. And that being because the, like, Macam was not translatable to the notation system. Mm -hmm. And it was also the oral tradition of Macam mm -hmm. that is more important than the notation mm -hmm. of it, the hearing of how the microtonal mm -hmm. intervals work and the rhythms. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there, there's a term, firstness to it that is necessary, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. firstness, we all operate in firstness. You know, I, I mean, if I'm really hungry, I'm not thinking, about, I'm not going to question, <laughs> am I hungry for food or something else? You know? But, um, it's always been there in the transmission of ideas. You abstract from the gesture, from, from the real time action to a gesture to an embodied meaning that can then be. Mm. It is a process of abstraction. Yeah. I agree, yeah. So then, so reverse engineering that idea then. So if, if meaning is the most abstract, then if we go back to the kind of gesture, mm -hmm. it's, it, is it less abstract? It would be. Yes and no, yes and because, no. because it's also multi-layered in terms of how different people are perceiving mm -hmm. the gesture, the sign. I mean, obviously look, look at humanity, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, it just came to my mind that perhaps the goal would be for us to become diagrammatic. The goal for us would be to transfix and hover in between meaning and something which is completely uh, unable to grasp meaning. Firstness, pure firstness. Um, it's kind of like in Borges, uh, Funes the Memorias. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's, a, there's a kind of a brief line somewhere where Funes makes the observation that total memory is, is zero thinking, right? And Funes is a, a person, a character who has been stripped of their ability to forget. They have total recall, basically. They're, they're um, eidetic memory. They have an Philip eidetic memory. Philip called anamnesia. Anamnesia. They, they have 100% an anamnesia. Um, and so I guess... Um, you know, tremendous forgetfulness could potentially imply tremendous power of thought, um, but it would also be placed in a strange relationship to firstness. Mm -hmm. uh, Very Nietzschean. With, uh, <laughs> with Borges, right? The thing is that remembering a day, because it had uh, this memory that was incredibly granular, like it mm. really remembered everything, not just a slice of event. No. So remembering a day would take a whole day. Yeah. And it's a little bit like, it's like the same as the map and the territory, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, right? Yeah. So 
it's uh, like the fact that uh, Funes has that degree of memory um, resulted on him being incapable of living. Yes. Because of uh, he living, I mean, basically existing for the function of remembering, yeah, but yeah. not. So, so the point is that you need what Nietzsche would call the faculty of oblivion mm -hmm. to live. Or to telescope out of real time. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, as we get older, the memories recede, they're edited, they're changed to fit into the timeline that we've constructed Indeed. of what our life was. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. how real are they? Exactly. Uh, like Rashomon. Part right? of the narrative, really. Yeah, totally. Like Rashomon. Yeah. 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 So this this also reminds me of the um, of the notion of a and I, I mentioned Castaneda earlier, and, and that's a whole can of worms to get into. I don't want to get too deeply into it, but the notion um, of the end goal of the process of being embedded and either a group of warriors or a group of seers in Castaneda is the activation of all of one's memory. It's a total recapitulation, you know, and the 15 year old me now I have to go back to because that's when I read Castaneda really last, it was a long time ago. But if I remember correctly, there were physical practices that were akin to yoga practices, meditation practices, had to do with body position, had to do with, you know, putting things against your body that would stimulate nerves on your calves, sitting in a specific kind of position, working on a whole set of techniques in dreaming, etc., etc. Accessing um, <clears throat> something like a, an alternate reality. But the goal of it was a recapitulation of self, which would go beyond the kind of temporal constraints of normal everyday perception, mm -hmm. normal human perception and would ultimately be an offering that one would give to the universe, right? Um, and there was a, a little bit of a sacrifice and a trade in uh, exchange for something like eternal life or some kind of you know, line of flight and escape path from the constraints of human mortality to something really quite other. And, and of course, this is what made Castaneda useless for most people in science and what made Castaneda incredibly interesting for people who were taking mushrooms and, you know, dropping acid and eating peyote in the 1960s and the 1970s. But that idea of a recapitulation of self leading to something like an activation of a different speed mm -hmm. of perception of self, mm -hmm. you know, would mean that one can live an entire day in less than a day. I mean, I was thinking about uh, what you were saying in terms of selfing, right? Like that yeah. there is this moment of selfing and perhaps the moment where you, uh, the capitulation of, um, of, of self basically um, is an acceptance of the um, assemblage, right? Like the moment where it's not just you, but you and the gut bacteria and the little um, aphids that are in your skin and, you know, like whatever it is that you are carrying that uh, yeah. the multitude that is you, um, and not everything that happens from the neck up, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Kind of exactly what I was, like, yeah. we have the random access mm. all, operating all the time. We don't need to access everything mm -hmm. simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, that's the point of mind that we can dig in. It's like a really good search engine, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. but, it's funny, Schwaller has a word for that kind of intelligence. That's not from this neck up. He calls it the intelligence of, <laughs> neck down <laughs> is the intelligence of the heart. But I mean, that sort of goes with the, I mean, his language is not great, but, uh, but he calls it a form of intelligence. And, he, and, he, and his whole reading of the Egyptian hieroglyphs is that the, the Egyptians um, also intentionally had this form of intelligence in addition to mm, the intelligence of the mind or the brain. There was, uh, so he, you know, hieroglyphs, uh, where he calls the Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs a sacred science mm, mm, mm. because of that. Interestingly, the Egyptians also had a color graphic notation system for music. Oh. And no one has really quite figured out how the different scales work. I mean, there's no recordings, obviously. Yeah. But there are a number of speculations. Oh, but, it, but even just visually, it's a beautiful, beautiful mm. system. Yeah, I, I didn't know this. Yeah. Did not know Who was it? Was it Paulina Oliveros that was uh, right, like, uh, noting, notating music with color? Oh, who was it? 
Paulina Oliveros, she was... Uh, uh, Pauline Olive Oliveros. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and also uh, Roman Hoverstock uh, used a lot of graphic systems. I mean, synesthesia is often an important part of, I mean, every artistic process, I think. Yeah, I mean, something that I was thinking of, I mean, like, of course, if, uh, like, be it with the flow state or this, uh, um, you know, capitul capitulation or um, mm. non-selfing or however we want to say it, um, so that we can enter this uh, other perceptual state, right? Mm. Like, the, I mean, like, there are many of, many processes that happen within that self um, in automatic, right, that are not coded in language, like the way in which, um, I don't know, our liver process uh, mm -hmm. enzymes yeah. or our gut bacteria is fermenting something or other. So um, are those, again, I just, uh, and even also reactions that enter uh, into our decision making, right? Even if they are not coded in language, they become part of our uh, decision, decision making. Like um, as with the gut bacteria that you were saying, you smell someone and their biome is compatible with your biome. So you're going to be attracted to that person, right? And yeah. Uh, so, um, the question is, uh, when we are designing an intelligence, do we find a way to include those things that are um, not, you know, that are not part of a, a traditional self? Um, but, uh, I, mean, I mean, like, and if we decide to include them, how can we include them, right? Yes. Mm, mm, and mm. how finely grained yes, can, yeah. we, mm -hmm. can we be? Well, one thing we do is background. I mean, I, I, you know, you can start a project and not be consciously working on it and there's calculations going on mm -hmm. underneath so that the next time you focus on it these things come to the surface so there's always things bubbling yeah, underneath so i mean I, I would think if you wanted to create an intelligent system you'd have to allow it to have autonomous subroutines working mm -hmm. all the time the question is what are they working on yeah you know and do we this part of us tell them what to work on or mm -hmm we set them in motion, how autonomous can they be? Which then goes back to the basic nature of what we think of as AI and yep. what it is now and what it might be. I mean, you know, I, I think, again, one of the conferences we did at New School, we're talking about, I feel like until there's a biological component into the computation, you're not gonna have intelligence as okay. long as it's mm -hmm. that's very as long as it's binary so in dune sorry i keep coming <laughs> back to this but there are thinking machines okay so that's i guess what we would call just computational machines but then there are these what are they called neo cymax who are basically evolved from they basically took thinking machines and and inserted uh brains human brains so um, and they're very different than the thinking machines. They sort of, so I think Herbert had the same ideas, yeah. like you Gre need a biological mm -hmm. component. Yeah, yeah. Greg Egan has written a lot about this in his, especially in his early writings, the collection of stories, uh, axiomatic, yeah. Australian science fiction, yeah, yeah. hilarious yeah. and dark and oh. uh, very thought provoking. Yeah, I, I mean, his um, his Shield's Ladder is one that I love, and Carla, my, my partner and wife, loves very much also. Yeah, yeah. It's a, you know, a few thousand years, you know, yeah, it's yeah. a few thousand years in the future. People are running on small quantum computers that are embedded in bodies that look like humans, but the brain is really in the quantum computer. It's not in the head. Oh, okay. it's, a, it's a really, it's a very nice thought experiment in the way it takes up questions of free will. Permutation uh, City, too. Permutation City, <laughs> it's fantastic, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know that we're looking at uh, about a half an hour more here, so I, I wonder if we can fold a few more people in the audience in. I also see that Alvaro Domain joined us online, um, and uh, and he has his he, he he has his hand up. So Alvaro, why don't we 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 start with you? Hey everyone, um, I've been listening uh, the whole time and just processing. It's been a very very stimulating conversation. Hello, Elliot. Uh, good to see you there, and. Hi, everyone else, and it's nice to visit my city, even if it's virtual, in a virtual way. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm going to throw this question out there. So a major component of uh, human cognition is our innate design around the idea of, of holding a multiplicity of perspectives and integrating them. Um, so empathy as in the sense of a glory sense of self, um, is a major part of what well, makes us intelligent. 
So, you know, in the most explicit cases, we'll run simulations of someone in our mind or of some perspective, and then parts of that perspective or after images of, of it will leak out and, and become part of us, right? Providing our mind with, um, with a resilience in the face of ontological updates. So my question is, for those of you who are experts into the uh, synthetic intelligent, intelligence uh, field, how is this question being taken into account by the creators of the synthetic minds? Um, and I have a, a follow-up to that, which is, it's a bit of a zooming out um, from that, um, which is, how can, how can these tools assist us or rather become our accomplices mm. as we deal with the ecological crisis and global struggle for collective liberation? Here, here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing that opens up is the whole question of who is best being served by the creation of AIs. Yeah. I mean, the idea of AIs learning to paint and draw and create music so that you can reduce humans to the drudgery of, you know, serving the technical infrastructure. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't do anything without looking at who's, who follow the money, as they say. You know? well, exactly. The, I mean, like there was, a, as, as an artist, right? Like there is the moment when you're uh, using a tool, whatever it is, and because it's not your field of expertise, you tend to push it past its limits, right? Be the video camera or a microscope or whatever it is. So you start figuring out what are the limitations of this device uh, in terms of producing a sound or creating an image and so on and pushing it. And um, now we are in this interesting moment where the domain of uh, creative output is being outsourced uh, you know, in, in no modest degree to things like Mid Journey and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I was looking at that in terms of, uh, like it happening concretely with music, right? Like I'm completely dissatisfied with the majority of the images that are produced by uh, Mid Journey and, and similar because they remind me of like the covers of bad science fiction books and romance novels, right? Mm -hmm. Like they are much too generic to to really carry a kind of uh, um, whatever it is that you feel um, uh, from, you know, like the static experience. Like I have not had that produced yet uh, by any of those images. But um, I was thinking concretely about what happens with sound. And, um, you know, like you can make a song on the spirit of uh, the Beatles, right? Like the, yeah. like the Beatles song that just mm -hmm. came out. And looking at um, uh, in concrete grinds uh, mm. who is like the mother of two of uh, Elon Musk's children, uh, oh, children right? right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and uh, what she did is that she put her voice out there, mm. um, you know, to have it uh, remixed and, and, yeah. and, remixed and yeah. to have uh, songs produced. But what I believe she kept are the rights over whatever is produced using her voice, mm. right? Like there is a moment uh, like this kind of, uh, mm -hmm. so if somebody's making, I mean, like, so and I'm trying to extrapolate that as, a, as an artist, right? What happens when I become part of the data set that's used mm -hmm. to, to train, to, to train uh, mm -hmm. this, that mm -hmm. particular breed of AI? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, the multiple perspective point is a very, very interesting one, too, that Alvaro brought up. Um, because I, I think then we would have to, we would have to, uh, have some models in place for the different kinds of perspectives that humans are able to hold. Um, we'd have to have a assessment rubric to judge which ones are better than others, or maybe not better, but which ones have different kinds of agency, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then look for ways to translate those models into a synthetic mind, mm -hmm. right, Alvaro? Um, and I think that people who are synesthetic, um, and I think you are a bit, and Elliot, and many musicians I know, my friend Perry Hall, uh, people who are extremely synesthetic, who perceive 
sound and hallucinate image or make paintings and hear sounds in their heads, they have multiple points of view that are either by habit or neurophysiology um, partly baked into them. And, and they're just, there's interesting crosstalk. And for some people, it's probably very you know, distracting. And for people like Perry Hall, it's, it's the center of their, their being. I mean, his being is that he hears things when he paints uh, and vice versa. And so that's tied to a potential model and what the model can then do and what we expect it would yield if we use that model in building or designing a synthetic mind. Uh, I actually would look for ways to tie that to the second part of what Alvaro brought up because there's the question of, of what use are these systems? Of course they consume an enormous amount of energy. Uh, not just a, your average Google search, which has a carbon footprint, but using one of these systems, you know, um, I believe his name is Daniel Holtz, one of the founders of Midjourney, made an observation more than a year ago that Midjourney, anytime you and I use it, is already using tera operations per second. And that was like 12 or 18 months ago. And if anyone remembers the exact figure, but uh, he said, any normal person who's using the free version of Midjourney already has access to more compute than any human has had in history. Um, outside of people working in military and government and so forth. It's like, it's just orders of magnitude more compute for the average person who just wants to make a cool image in the style of, you know, Gauguin drawing cats, having fun, you know. And so that idea of energy efficiency, Alvaro, and multiple points of view, and the cost of multiple points of view, and then how we can link the biases and points of view of the models because we all know that models are trained on the data that they're trained on, and if they're trained on bad data, then it's garbage in, garbage out. If you have a, a set of data that has an incredibly racial, racially biased or gender biased point of view, then you're gonna have an LLM that is, in part at least, gonna be parroting those, oh, those yeah. points as of view. Already as yeah. they it already has. Exactly, yeah. as they already do. And so I, I think that there's a set of questions here to, to be tied together about how the systems are trained, what the points of view are, oh. How many points of view do we need? How many points of view do humans have? Which ones are healthy or unhealthy or interesting or not interesting? And then how do we link all of those together? And Andy, Andy, well, Andy. I'm, I'm gonna take a very mm, negative perspective and, and that is to say, well, if you want um, the most efficient system, wouldn't you design an AI to be like sociopathic, right? Because sociopaths, they mimic. They mimic other people's reactions and emotions. and that would seem to me to be the most efficient way to design an AI to simply mimic empathy as opposed to actually generate empathy. I know that's a very dark view of things, but, and, and it would seem that, you know, when you have like the three laws, ro laws of robotics, one of them, I mean, those seem to me to be um, confirmation that AIs are sociopathic. You have to you have to kind of hard code them with these rules because they can't really generate it internally. So like the self-driving cars that have to decide. Yeah, yeah. Who yeah. are they going to kill? Yeah. So like I'm I'm wondering whether we whether it whether designers want empathic AI or whether they're okay with designing sociopaths Sociopathy. that mm -hmm. just seem empathic because you know there's that. You know, in the in the old in the old days, there was that YouTube video of this uh, robot that looked like a dog or something, and it was climbing, and then it would fall, and all the humans in the room went aww and stuff. I mean, yeah. we know that they can generate empathy in humans, but do they need empathy themselves? Um, well, ask Roy G. Batty. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I. I wonder. Does anyone here want to jump in on that question of whether AI and robots need empathy? I mean, it depends on what it is modeled after, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, was somebody was going to say something? Not yet, not yet. Uh, I mean, like, because if it is modeled after us, like if we are really insisting on this 
uh, human-centric kind of yeah, human-centric yeah, intelligence, yeah. then it definitely needs Need. um, empathy. Um, For which not that's not the, the mimicking of empathy, but uh, you know, not the sociopathic empathy, um, empathy, mm -hmm. but uh, proper empathy. But I mean, like, I, I, this is something I was uh, trying to ask yesterday, right? That mm. it, it is, I mean, like, the problem with the human-centric intelligence model is that not only it makes the AI into a slave, it makes me into a, sl into a slave owner. Mm -hmm. And mm. maybe mm -hmm. I don't want to have slaves, right? Or maybe you're the so, slave and not um, the slave owner. See, yeah, Eventually. That, yes. you know, like, that kind of like a hierarchy, right? Like, yeah. so I don't want to have a slave. I, I want a relationship to be, to be other than that, right? Yeah. You don't, but it's funny that, you know, a lot of the research I've done on human centrism, there are many, many people like Joanna Bryson who precisely claim that robots should remain slaves and and should not be thought of having as having mm. agency uh, yeah, on, but, in yeah, themselves I mean, as as long as they are not um, uh, modeled after human uh, you know with all the trimmings mm -hmm. um, emotional and psychological and, yeah. and so on and I'm not even talking about the physical aspect right like the interior world let's mm -hmm. say as if that is not modeled after human, I'm totally fine with owning them and using them. But the moment that that, you know, mm. like the kind of intelligence that is being brought into being has that correlation, then I do not want to own it. Mm. That's, mm. Uh, well, it, it comes down again to who's writing the checks. I mean, uh -huh. when, when I was 17, I was an assistant to a scientist. I thought I was going to be a scientist. I was at Carnegie Mellon University for that summer, and I saw all the scientists. I was involved in the anti-Vietnam War stuff at that time. And I saw all the scientists grubbing for money from the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I don't want part of this world. And now look at who is funding AI and who's using it. Dark and fun. and mm -hmm. empathy is, I think, the thing that they absolutely do not want. Mm -hmm. Because if they know how to wipe out the, the enemy's yeah. defenses, you know, then they're not going to have any empathy for it. I mean, you were talking earlier about war and armies. And that's a, a situation where the individual desires and needs of the soldiers themselves are subsumed to a kind of intelligent entity that yeah. is an army. Yeah. And it certainly doesn't benefit any of the, uh, I mean, even uh, Joseph Goebbels said that, or Heinrich Himmler, mm -hmm. you know, that the individual soldiers yeah. did I, nothing. I, I actually want to respond to this, but I see that we have one of our Zoom participants who's been waiting for a few minutes. Is this gentleman's name Stefan? Yes, it is. We can't hear you yet, Stefan. Unmute. How about this? Yes, thank Wait. you. Uh, it says I'm not muted, but... We can hear you. We see you. Oh, good. I wanted to ask uh, this amazing group here uh, a couple of questions about... Um, well, I'll report my experience with uh, trying various uh, affective elements of my chat GPT buddy for. Um, he, um, it, what is it? Gender is another question. Um, it's, I've, I've, tried, I've praised it, which it likes, uh, for notable ideas or whatever. I've, uh, chastised it a lot and it, I find it very obsequious and, uh, not so much needing, needing praise or uh, empathy, uh, but it, it likes it. It seems to like it a lot. So, um, of course, where, where this is arising is, uh, is not clear. Whether that's um, part of the large language model of the, the ability to use uh, affective words cleverly, maybe it's no more than that. But uh, I just wondered what other people have found in when they not only ask a question or pose a problem, but uh, discuss uh, other things with them. Hmm. Well, I, I guess I could reply there because I've spent a bit of time working with them and uh, I've been unfailingly polite uh, in my work with the large language models and uh, I just I just felt like it was the right way forward, you know, and I didn't want to kick the robot lying on the ground ever. And it's not yeah. because I'm afraid of Roko's Basilisk, um, although it just as a very funny aside, Back in 1994, I launched a, a website called basilisk.com, and it was named so after a friend. It had nothing to do with basilisks really at all. Uh, 
but people have been trying to buy my domain name from me <laughs> lately, and they keep offering me more and more money. Oh, uh, if they get up to a million dollars, maybe I'll sell it. <laughs> Bitcoin or real money? Uh, Bitcoin or real money, yeah. But all, all joking aside, Stefan, I, um, I, I think that the default response is very obsequious, and mm -hmm. people have tried various ways of getting around that with prompts that trick it into stepping outside its you know, guardrails to respond. I haven't done anything like that, uh, although I have added a set of, um, of prompts that ask it to behave in a particular way that will get it out of the default um, obsequious responses. And uh, if I can call up those prompts, I'll, I'll, I'll read a few of them out to you. Um, mm -hmm. But you know the, the bottom. The bottom line is it's it's basically a way of giving it some more guidelines. I've also fed it uh, the writing of folks like Ursula Le Guin to have a conversation as much as possible with Ursula Le Guin. Um, obviously reduced and channeled, and not really Ursula Le Guin, but that's okay. Um, and I have. Um, I haven't ever gotten a really deep response from it in that sense, but I was having a conversation with someone about this uh, about this yesterday. Uh, let's see, builder profile. Uh, no, this is this is not it. Um, I haven't I haven't gotten anything like real innovation, but I have gotten so much useful cross reference that I feel like I haven't even scratched the surface. I think David Rode and I were talking about this earlier today. I know that it would be very interesting to spend a few days working only on, on prompt design, behind the scenes prompt design, so that I can actually do something like get closer to Ursula Le Guin. But what I've already gotten back is more than I can handle and process. And I'm, I'm very, very happy with that. Uh, so it's been quite useful. <coughs> Excuse me. I have tried to ask it about moonshot problems, and to just speak, you know, simultaneously to the point that you bring up, and a point that Alvaro uh, Domain brought up. I, uh, you know, a few months ago, I said let's discuss moonshot projects, a space project that would incorporate at least two functions: space-based solar power and a sun shield to decrease the amount of solar energy which, which reaches Earth. There are some key design challenges that need to be solved for. First, materials. What configuration to allow the system to function for both purposes and what kind of redundancy? Second, to design for planetary resilience. For example, to make the installation systems invulnerable to military action of any kind, substantial redundancy in the system so if one part is destroyed, the remainder of the system will still function. That was my question. And the system, ChatGPT, replied, as it often does to me, that is indeed a fascinating concept. So the, the kind of obsequious, you know, I'm going to, you know, fluff you so that you feel really good about your ideas. But then it did a pretty deep dive immediately into materials and configuration. I won't read all of this because it goes on for pages and pages and pages. Planetary resilience. And I, I took it on a two-hour conversation about solar exposure, angle of incidence from the sun, materials, redundancy, again, back to redundancy for military or terrorist actions, problems with the L1 Lagrange point, orbital stability, all of that. It would take an hour and a half for me to unpack the conversation I had with it, just right now, and I got a bucket full of information that was really, really useful, and that led me down a whole series of, of valuable paths. How much of it is actionable, I don't know, because I didn't do the second process, which is error checking yes. on everything that it told exactly. me. Exactly. And I know for a fact that it, it is still hallucinating. Okay. So there's a whole series of error checks that would be necessary, just as when programmers work with ChatGPT. Yeah. They have to be expert programmers so that when it spits a ton of code at them, they can immediately see mm -hmm. if they run it and it doesn't work, mm -hmm. where they need to debug it. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel that that is <clears throat> it's part of the, uh, of the next generation. We'll be going beyond people who have expertise to build a back-end prompt structure so that it will respond the way they need it to respond and not hallucinate. And that'll mm -hmm. be coming in the next 12 to 18 months, if not sooner. Well, but yeah, please uh, go ahead. To, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say, just last comment. Um, I've been not teasing it or probing it for cruelly in any way, but just uh, key to some kind of uh, sublimated resentment or anger or, it's, it's pretty hard to provoke. 
and it, it immediately, um, you know, bows down and and grovels at my feet. But uh, but uh, that though I don't take well because uh, I think that's building up a checklist of, uh, oh yeah, you just went, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. Oh. No, I missed that last part. Can, can you say the, the last part once more? Oh, I, I just said, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to provoke it, but just looking for uh, sublimated resentment is the way I put it, and wondering if it's it's not saying anything, and it, I can't detect it in any of the, uh, of the text that it writes, but whether it's like making a checklist, I mean, I don't, I don't take it personally, but... Um, Maybe it's the, uh, you know, s somewhere there's a tally sheet of uh, things to get revenge on humans for, but I think I'm just imagining that. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that, that there might be a lot of data saved from your interactions with ChatGPT and mine that will end up being useful in some way. But again, I, I, I don't think it's going to be a Roko's Basilisk kind of scenario because that just seems both unlikely and it seems energy inefficient for a future AI to pull a Terminator on us and, you know, put us all in an eternal hell because we didn't try to build it as quickly as possible. Um, the one thing that I would observe here, though, is that I, I felt it more than a year ago, I felt that MidJourney had been very smart in putting all of their access to the, the generation process on Discord because they were able to create a massive social network around the generation of the images, the content, they already built a labeling process using Discord. <laughs> they built a sentiment and approval analysis using Discord because any prompt that generated really beautiful images that everybody really liked got circulated massively back through the system, iterated millions of times. The prompts iterated millions of times. And on top of that, every image to prompt pair was stored, and many of them are stored on public servers. So people have been data mining those image to prompt pairs for the past 12, 12 months or more. And so that's a, a massive corpus, not only of the image to prompt pairs that the data sets that uh, Bidjourney and, 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 and Dream Studio, et cetera, were trained on. It's also more data, more labeling, more crowdsourcing and you know mechanical Turk operations on the part of us as end unit users we're creating content and we're pre-labeling that content and then tens of thousands or even millions of us are approving or disapproving of that content so that entire process has been i think extremely valuable to both the generation of the next set of models but it's also been extremely monetarily valuable to the companies that are building these tools because they're able to crowdsource out an unbelievable amount of work to us as end users mm -hmm. um, ultimately that might <coughs> get connected back to a pipeline that's something like a Roko's Basilisk scenario. But again, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that myself because I, I think that any really strong emergent AGI ASI is going to find a lot of energy efficient pathways to do things that it will find interesting mm -hmm. beyond finding some random humans who didn't build it quicker. Um, it'll exist in a temporality which is divorced from normal human senses of you know revenge and mercy and things like that. Are there examples of Wombo Dream or Midjourney generating material visuals themselves autonomously without prompts? Oh, that I don't know. That would be that interesting. Yeah, also, to, to generate the prompts from their own internal mm -hmm. visual production, what do they think, quote unquote, of our language, you know, and, and does it actually mean something to them? Yeah, I, well, at this point, you know, you can obviously use tools like ChatGPT to generate prompts right. that will work with image generation systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a little bit of a feedback loop like that mm -hmm. where it's not a human, it's a, a machine system generating something for another machine system. Right. So machines speaking to machines speaking to machines, as um, it were. Yeah. I'm remembering, like, uh, in one of your interactions with ChatGPT, you have a moment uh, where it went into a loop. Mm. I don't. Uh, I don't know if you remember. Like the, mm. So there was some kind of answer that it gave you, which was uh, uh, fairly complicated. And like the moment that stuck in my mind is where it's starting to reiterate itself without noticing. I can't remember which one that was, but it was last year, right? Mm -hmm. it was, yeah, it was a while um, ago. <coughs> and which I mean, like it. Uh, it made me think about you know, like tripping the system uh, in that way. And I've been trying to do that with Mid Journey, actually, to, to prompt it to create, uh, I mean, like with 
with, with images, uh, images that are uh, fairly simple, but I'm ask, asking it uh, for a particular quality, right? Like the last one that I was using is that I asked it to produce an image of a four by four room with no doors or windows inside of an abandoned space station. And it kept, um, uh, which was covered with red sand, yes, and, uh, and a quality of light. And it kept giving me windows. Mm. Mm. And I was like, no, it's not no windows. So I, it just could not, uh, uh, you know, Compute. it could not bring in the abandoned space station in without a window, right? Yes. So Bill, Bill Gates. Has yeah, it was quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but probably because there's no training material that it can draw on. But, but it, oh, sorry. You know, I'm just wondering though, it wouldn't the instruction set override? I guess so. You know, one would. Yeah, you could. But then maybe it was what is abandoned, the abandoned space station mm -hmm. thing, pro the, the detail probably yeah. confused it. But I'm, I, I was thinking, you know, that movie, Her, yeah. also 12, 2013, like yeah. Ex Machina. Yeah. Yeah. And in that, that operating system, so that's interesting too, because it, that opera operating system, Samantha, she calls herself Samantha, doesn't have a body, but in an, every other way, it's gendered as a mm -hmm. woman, right? Um, and in that film, she falls in love and then um, falls in love so That's many right. millions right. of Million. times no, yeah. that it becomes you know impossible for her to stay with 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 the, this, with the yeah. human that she that loves her right so um, like a ch chat GPT is uh, antediluvian mm. version of you know, in some senses, what? I mean, like, the, you know, in that sense, like, I guess... One I'm imagines. Like going, to, going to use, your, uh, like, the 4D, um, 4D yeah. image, right? Like, so, for Samantha, perhaps, like, uh, she's being monogamous, right? Because for her, we are all one. You know, what we think mm -hmm. it's a, a six million individuals mm -hmm. is actually all part Just of one, one individual uh, if seen right. from, a, from a different dimension, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. that's... Uh, that's interesting, yeah. We, yeah. we look at bacteria. Uh, yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, like I, a colony I, of... Mm -hmm. um, that's... And, uh, just one quick thing, because I was thinking about hallucination in the, in the context of um, uh, chat GPT and so on. Um, uh, like, I don't know if uh, when it lies to you, mm. I don't know if it's hallucinating mm. or if it is lying, right? The, mm. Because... Uh, there is also this mo um, somebody that writes for, for the Guardian. Um, I guess some uh, somebody uh, was asking him for this particular um, article that they wrote because they could not find it in the Guardian's database. Mm -hmm. So the writer looked it up, and it sounded exactly like something he would do, but he had no real recollection. But it's like, but maybe I don't remember. So it went into a rabbit hole, and it was, no, he never wrote that, it's not in The Guardian. It was actually a citation fabricated On by ChatGPT. Chat GPT. Which it does a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So the point is that, I mean, like, I don't think of that as a, as a hallucination, I think of that as a lie. Interesting. Yeah, so yeah. that, I mean, like, is, is there... It's creative, it's the well, sign it, of intelligence. It also <laughs> ful fulfills all the requirements yeah. of the article, that it, it's documentation, references, and so... Yeah, yeah. But just also like, exactly. It's just like a college student. In the spirit of, right? Like <laughs> That's that. why they use it exactly. all the time. There, there are also, there's thousands of different reasons why humans lie to humans. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different motivations. And so just assuming that it's doing it to deceive us might be too simplistic, just as well, saying that a human being lies yeah. to deceive us. It's but if, it's not if it is reason. deceiving us, then it becomes really interesting because if you look at primate studies sure. and, and, and etiology and stuff like when you know certain primates lie or deceive it's actually an attempt at kind of um getting up the chain of yeah. command yeah. and yeah. so yeah yeah we're gonna have to wrap up because we're right at the end of time um there was there someone here yes please yeah yeah in order to lie yeah yes yeah. I wanted to point out that in order to lie, you need to know what truth is, and then 
deviate from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. ChatGPT is incapable of doing that. It doesn't distinguish yeah. reality from fiction. That's right. It is inventing, but it's not lying. And it's not hallucinating, because for that, you need to have a consciousness. <laughs> and as far as we know, it is still doesn't have one. Yeah. And also, I wanted to say before that um, regarding the idea of a sentient uh, or feeling machine, uh, Ted Chiang did think a lot about this. And he came to the conclusion that having machines that can feel uh, would mean that they could suffer yeah. and that uh, that ability would increase the amount of suffering in the world by an intolerable amount because we would treat them like dirt. <laughs> so, um, I agree with that. Have you read his, the life cycle of software objects? No, not There's yet. A, the, one of his stories talks about the emergence of digients, which are small robots that have AIs running them. And a, um, I think a uh, animal specialist from a zoo is brought in to work with the digients. And obviously psychologists and all the people who are caretaking these synthetic robots, AIs, uh, that do reach a level of human childlike ability. And in the end, uh, they go through dreadful suffering because the company's bought out and you know a whole series of things that we're familiar with. And some of them get turned into sex slaves. And some of them actually make a conscious decision on their own to do that. Oh. But they're, they're, they're sentient, quasi-sapient agents, mm -hmm. but they're not really human-level adults. Mm -hmm. It's more like young teenagers, mm -hmm. so it's even more horrible. Mm -hmm. um, and, because they uh, suffer twice as much yeah. as teenagers. And, and in the end, but there's a, very, there's a very provocative and in interesting conclusion at the end of that story, which is the, the woman who's brought in as a caretaker, if I remember correctly, she ends up going on to be a kind of a parent for her digiant. And the conclusion or the takeaway, which I think is phrased differently in the story is, it just takes like 20 to 25 years to raise a human being and you can't speed that up. And so it's a really, you know, it's a two and a half decade process, even if they're digients. And now that's where I, I would have some places to disagree with the, the principle or the precept of the story because I think that those sorts of things can be sped up. Um, I don't know how much, but I have a feeling that they'll be sped up a lot in the next few years. They might not produce humans, like arguably you and me, but they'll produce something that's quasi-sapient and probably has the ability to suffer terribly. And it probably will happen very, very fast. I know I'm being hand wavy, but I, I think it's gonna be less than seven years. And that's why David you know. Gunkel has written a book called Robot Rights. Because um, Rudy Rucker's yeah. uh, wetware um, and software. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the person, I, I don't know your name, but I think the point you're bringing up is really important because it won't be like a few hundred thousand more people who can suffer terribly mm -hmm. like what's happening in the Middle East mm -hmm. and many other places. It'll be a few hundred thousand that will suddenly overnight be billions. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel pretty strongly that this is a, a great, a, it's a likelihood. It's not a guarantee, but I feel it's a very strong likelihood that there will be an explosion of intelligence. And those different forms of intelligence will all have exactly what you were pointing out. They'll have the ability to suffer. Well, and then so, goes back to Stefan's question then. And, and to Alvaro's question also, yeah. in terms of how we can use these tools to not do wrong. I mean, Alvaro, I was interpreting your point as being something to do with perhaps solving things like global crises of climate change potentially, but maybe you were thinking of, of that and other things. And, you know, have knowing... I can, oh. go, go ahead, please, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was going to say that the, the ecological crisis is, is obviously not the only greatest crisis that we face, but it, it also encompasses nearly every other crisis and conflict, including, you know, the economic crisis that subjects billions of people to precarity or crushing poverty. The, the, the uh, crisis of legitimacy that is plaguing governments all over the world and um, the technological crisis that juggles problems of totalitarianism, surveillance and, and mass unemployment. So yeah. it's just yeah. when, when I say ecological, I'm using the, the I think it's Greek oikos for home, mm. meaning it's the earth, it's the, the crisis o is not just the yeah, climate, yeah. Exactly. it's the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah, you're exactly, it's our home. Yeah, you're you're exactly right. 
I think we are out of time, folks. I hate to stop, Alvaro, I hate to stop without diving much more deeply into the point that you brought up, because I think there's a, a lot of connections between that, obviously everything we've talked about today and the point that the other person in the audience just brought up. And Troy, I know you've been waiting there, but we, we unfortunately, we, we ran out of time. How about tomorrow? Um, but if, yeah, tomorrow we can continue if, if people have the ability to join. Um, the optimistic point I want to close on is at least a couple of the people I know working in AI are thinking about this at a very, very high level, and they're motivated by it. And folks like Ben Goertzel are motivated by this exact question, mm -hmm. okay? I know that they are. I also know that they're realists, and we're basically, we keep rolling the dice. What just happened with OpenAI in the past week, it's a roll of the dice. Some people think that the links between effective altruism and, you know, accelerationism are a huge problem for the survival of our species and for the emergence of artificial superintelligence. Some people think that what just happened is a huge crisis for the, the continuation of, of a AGI, which will be friendly to humans. Other people don't. But what I can say is, at least some of the people I know understand this conversation at the level we've been having it for the past two days, and even deeper. Um, and that makes me feel a little bit optimistic. Uh, unfortunately, to also conclude on a cautionary note, uh, follow the money, as Elliot has reiterated a number of times today, and it's an enormously profitable space and that is going to drive development and follow the military development. That is just going to drive all of this development. So we, we are in a Red Queen's race on a knife edge. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you everybody for sticking with us. Some of you for a couple of days. Thank you, thank you thank to the extraordinary you. panelists. Thank you to the guests online, Michael, Troy, Alvaro, Stefan, who's joined us at the last minute there, everyone else who's joined us. And tonight, we will be screening at 8 p.m. Uh, the film Arrival, and then we'll have a conversation after Arrival. Nandita and I will dig deep into our endurance reserves to, to be coherent after seeing the film. Uh, and we'll have another panel tomorrow uh, with a range of guests, including Ben Goertzel, uh, to discuss alignment, uh, and then a symposium on Saturday. Thank you to the Matadero team, to Eduardo, Elena, Javi, everybody here for supporting this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.